Um, so to begin the agenda, this is a review session for the New York City Planning Commission held in the lower concourse of 120 Broadway. Today is December 13th, 2018, and the time is 1.05 p.m. Oh, December 3rd. My, ah, the first item on our agenda is a certification of a city map amendment in Queens Community District 13. That's might be where I did that. And our presenter is Philip Montgomery. Uh, Chair, yes. I'm recused from this. Oh, okay. Yes. By Jug Handel Realty LLC, a private applicant, and the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Uh, the proposed amendment involves the elimination, narrowing, and realignment of a portion of the Nassau Expressway within the area bounded by 159th Street, Rockaway Boulevard, and the Nassau Expressway. Uh, the proposed action would facilitate the development of a distribution facility uh, for Bartlett Dairy and create a site for future development uh, in the Springfield Gardens neighborhood of Queens Community District 13. Uh, the project area is located in an M11 zoning district just north of JFK Airport uh, between the Rockaway Boulevard on the north and east and the built portion of the Nassau Expressway on the south and west. Uh, the area surrounding the site consists of transportation, industrial, manufacturing, and commercial office uses. Uh, and there is a large area of R32 residential located north of Rockaway Boulevard. Uh, aside from the airport itself, the major facilities in the area are the 375,000 square foot FAA office building uh, north and west of the site and a Green Line's bus garage, bus garage, which occupies a two-block area across Rockaway Boulevard to the northeast of the site. Uh, there are no subways in the area, but the Q6 bus line runs along, along Rockaway Boulevard with multiple stops near the project site. The project site lies within the JFK Industrial Business Zone. The, the subject portion of the Nassau Expressway is city-owned and mapped to an irregular width. It was established on the city map in the 1970s and was intended to facilitate the construction of a flyover from the Nassau Expressway directly into JFK. Uh, the flyover was never constructed and there are no future plans to do so. Uh, the property is undeveloped with the exception of a small Con Edison substation located near the center of the site uh, that has a narrow paved area that leads to the substation from Rockaway Boulevard. Uh, the Con Ed facility will remain in place uh, within an easement that will be created for Con Edison use. Uh, the, the top left photo is looking towards the Con Edison facility from Rockaway Boulevard. Uh, the top right photo is looking west at the site from the Nassau Expressway off-ramp, and the bottom photo is looking north towards Rockaway Boulevard from the southwest corner of the project site. Uh, the proposed amendment will create an 8.75-acre city-owned development site. Uh, 6.15 acres are proposed to be disposed of to Jug Handle Realty to facilitate the development of a 47,750-foot distribution warehouse with office space and also a 6,300-square-foot vehicle maintenance facility uh, for Bartlett Dairy. Entrance to the facility would be through a single curb cut on Rockaway Boulevard. Uh, 2.6 acres would remain in city ownership, and there are no current plans for development, but the site would likely be used for parking. Uh, this is the site plan of, of the site. The area outlined in red is the proposed Bartlett facility and the area in blue is the uh, future development. And this is an illustrative uh, rendering of the future site from uh, the Rockaway Boulevard. Uh, lastly, uh, Bartlett Dairy was founded in Queens in 1968 and were located at the Elmhurst facility in Jamaica until 2016 when their leases uh, were not renewed. Uh, they then moved their operations to their Newark facility, and uh, this proposal would bring approximately 165 jobs back to Queens. Thank you. Questions from the commission? 
Yes. Yes, Vice Chair Knuckles. Did you say 165 jobs? Yes, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah. And 165 industrial jobs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yes, <laughs> Commissioner Dweck. Have they anticipated their uh, future growth plans? I, I'm not aware of that. I can I can look into it and get back to you. Thank you. Other questions? Then this application is certified. Thank you. The second item on the agenda, page nine, is a certification of a disposition of city-owned property, zoning map, and zoning text amendments in the Bronx Community District 1. Uh, our presenter is Christine Camilleri. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, this application is submitted jointly by the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, um, along with Phipps Houses, a nonprofit housing developer. Um, the actions are requested to facilitate a residential development consisting of approximately 55 affordable units um, proposed for location at Block 2360, Lots 1 and 3 in Community District 1 in the Bronx. Um, and HPD, as part of this application, seeks a disposition of the publicly owned portion of the proposed development site. Um, in addition, as co-applicants, HPD and Phipps Houses are requesting a zoning map amendment to rezone the site from R72 to C62. Um, the, the residential equivalent for that zoning district is R8. Um, a, along with a zoning text amendment to designate the a, a mandatory inclusionary area and a special permit pursuant to zoning resolution section 74681 to permit development within or over a railroad or transit right of way or yard. And so the, the project site is located in the South Bronx um, in the neighborhood of Melrose. And for context, um, here is an aerial view. Um, the site is um, called out here in the red uh, solid line. Um, and we, we wanted to highlight that um, this uh, site is actually located um, directly across Brook Avenue to the, to the west, um, called out within the, with the um, yellow dotted line you see here um, is the beginning of the Melrose Commons Urban Renewal Area, which was adopted in 1994. Um, the you know, building stock in this area is quite varied, um, but um, does consist of a lot of larger campus style housing developments, including the Melrose, Melrose Houses, which are, are located um, here to the west, as well as some large, uh, some smaller um, tenement style and garden style buildings. Um, there, the area has seen a lot of HPD development in the last decade, and um, we wanted to highlight just two of two of these um, developments via Verde, which is located immediately to the south, um, right here, um, and which is uh, which is a 20-story, 222-unit um, mixed income development um, that completed construction in 2012. Um, La Centrale is um, located here also to the south um, that is currently under construction, um, which will bring um, just under 1,000 um, units to, to the area as well. Um, the site's well served by transit. Um, it, uh, the two and five trains stop at 149th Street and 3rd Avenue, um, uh, just about a half a mile south, um, south of the site. Um, that, that stop is also located within the hub, which is a significant retail, um, retail and uh, uh, transit um, center for the South Bronx, um, as well as the two and five also stop at Jackson Avenue. Um, uh, and the Metro North um, station at Melrose is located um, a half a mile um, to the north northwest of the site. Um, here's a closer look at the proposed site, again called out um, within the red red line, um, which measures approximately 7,400 square feet. Um, and here is an area map to give you a sense of the land uses and zoning um, that is predominant in the area. Um, the built character is quite mixed, but the um, immediate vicinity um, is primarily residential, particularly to the north and south along Brook Avenue, as well as um, to the east along um, St. Anne's Avenue. Um, but there is significant commercial activity along Third Avenue. 
um, to, to the west. Um, the site you can see on this map is located in an R72 zoning district currently. Um, there is also a C62 district um, just to the east and south of the site. Here are some photos um, of the site and surrounding area, um, starting clockwise from the upper left-hand side. Um, we have a few of the site facing southeast from the corner of Brook Avenue and East 157th Street. Um, in this photo and the photos that follow, um, you can see the Via Verde site directly, directly straight ahead to the south. Um, on the upper right-hand side, a view of Brook Avenue facing south um, and with the site, um, a site visible on the left and um, on the bottom left-hand side view of the site facing southeast um, from East 157th Street. Um, and you can see from this these photos as well as the aerial we were looking at that it is the site is currently unimproved. Um, and just here are two illustrative renderings um, uh, of you first looking south and, and looking north. Um, the development, proposed development would consist of approximately 55 affordable units um, within a nine-story building that would uh, rise to approximately 87 feet. Um, and so to, to facilitate this development, a few, several actions are requested. Um, first, HPD is um, seeking approval for the disposition of lot number three, um, which is um, city owned. As shown in this diagram, this lot is located um, directly adjacent to a lot that is lot one, which is privately owned by the developer. Um, they, the applicants are also seeking, uh, jointly FIPS houses and HPD are seeking a zoning map amendment to rezone um, the project site from R72 to C62. And um, this district would function as an extension of the C62 district that's located immediately to the south um, across East 156th Street. Um, the applicants are um, seeking to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area um, also on the site, the option one is proposed, which would require that 25% of the residential floor area be provided as housing affordable permanently to households at an average of 60% of the area median income with an additional 10% of units to be made affordable to households at or below 40% of AMI. Um, also requested is a zoning special permit um, to section 74681 of the zoning resolution. Um, this action is requested because a portion of the development site includes a section of the former Port Morris branch of the New York and Harlem Railroad line. Um, and this permit is sought to allow development over this right of way. Um, on this slide, th this is the site, a site plan that would be tied to the approval of this special permit and the, the right of way is um, highlighted within in the blue dotted lines here and here. Um, and this uh, special permit has a series of findings in your briefing packages. You've received a copy of the applicant's detailed responses to, to each of those findings. Um, but to summarize, um, the, the applicants will do have to um, uh, demonstrate a few specific things. Um, first, that the streets providing access to the development um, are adequately able to handle any projected new traffic. Um, second, that the distribution of floor area and number of dwelling units do not adversely impact the surrounding area. Um, and also that any new uses, developments, or enlargements proposed on the zoning lot do not adversely impact each other. Um, and lastly, that the site plan and design of the development does not preclude the future use of or improvements to the right of way if it's deemed, if the right of way is deemed appropriate for those uses. Um, and a, a few notes on that last point, um, in 2005, the State Department of Transportation did release its rights to use the abandoned right of way for future transportation uses, and there are no current plans um, for use of this right of way um, uh, for, for transportation uses. Um, and the commission also has reviewed several projects in the last um, few years that have applied for this special permit to develop over this right of way, including Melrose Common Site B most recently, um, and Via Verde, the development that's located close by, also develop, also um, submitted an application for this special permit. So it is, is no longer a continuous um, railroad right of way. Um, and just to kind of walk through this site plan in a, a, a little more detail, the proposed new building would consist of approximately 46,000 square feet. Um, of that, 1,100 square feet um, would be 
provided as dedicated community facility space on the ground floor. Um, that would be utilized um, as, as a, a meeting space, um, gym, and laundry room. Um, a, a building entrance would be provided um, on Brook Avenue right here to um, residents of the building, and an additional um, entrance would be located on the corner of Brook Avenue and East 156th Street to um, provide access to the community, some of that community facility space. Um, the development would include a total of approximately 1,200 square feet of open space, including a landscaped front yard um, and rear yard. And the development does provide, uh, does qualify for a parking waiver um, based on the project's income restricted units and because it is located in a transit zone. Um, and I will close it again with the, uh, this rendering um, and um, uh, the proposed development illustrative rendering um, of the project and close for, pause for questions at this time. Yes. Commissioner Efron. It's not a very big community facility space, but is FIPS planning to use it for its own use or I think uh, that is there another intended use that we should be aware of? Sure. Um, uh, as far as the, um, uh, right now, um, the plans are, uh, the meeting room, I think, are to be determined. Um, but I could I could reach out to the applicants I'm for sure more information. I'm sure we'll learn yeah. more. But sure. Curious. Of course. Other questions? Commissioner Levin. Um, yes, I wonder if when this comes back, we could see an image of the backside of what we're looking at here. Sure. Um, realize that the um, building will rise above Melrose Court to the east and it mm -hmm. looks like there's a parking area that's you know roughly the size of a city street so that that mm -hmm. eastern elevation will be permanently visible be nice to know that it's Absolutely. getting the same um, attention to detail that these two sides get sure we can request that image More, Commissioner Ortiz hi um, I, I had some question clarification. I know Via mm -hmm. Verde came before I joined um, the commission, but um, with respect to the transit right of way, um, so so is this then a spur that's not connected in any way to any other piece of this railway? The, it is. It is the the railroad right of way is discontinuous at this time, um, due okay. due in part to. So it's like an orphaned piece correct. of the yeah. railway. Correct. Okay. Thank you. I'm um, sorry. Another another unrelated question mm -hmm. to that. Um, I had heard that Via Verde was having some trouble uh, leasing ground floor retail space. Um, I don't know if that's still the case, um, but you know it's, it's new space, um, presumably in good condition. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we look at the ground floor here, I think we should be mindful of whether we're adding to, you know, an oversupply. Sure, and I think just to, to clarify, the ground floor space of this development will be um, used as community facility space, um, not, not commercial, but it's um, a good point nonetheless. Commissioner Capelli. Who orphaned the transit piece? <laughs> And so, in uh, it, it was it, in 2005 was the formal um, formal release by the State Department of Transportation of its rights to use that right of way. Um, and who uh, was the former user of it? Um, I, I believe um, it was under it, it was the Port Morris branch of the New York Central Line. That was um, that's that's our understanding. Okay. I believe yeah. that it was in connection with the uh, creation of the Oak Point Link. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, the application is certified. The third item on the agenda, uh, page 39, is a certification of a UDAP designation disposition of city-owned property in Brooklyn Community District 16. <coughs> Our presenter is Anthony Grande. Uh, good afternoon. Um, this is an application by the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development for a UDAP and disposition to facilitate the development of two new 100% uh, affordable four-story residential buildings with a total of 32 units in the Ocean Hill neighborhood of Brooklyn Community District 16. Uh, the project areas are located in the northwest portion of uh, Community District 16. 
Um, the project area consists of two separate uh, development sites in the same general area of the Ocean Hill neighborhood. Um, both sites are uh, city-owned vacant lots um, proposed uh, for new residential development by HPD. The Howard Avenue development site is an approximately 8,200 square foot corner lot with frontage on Howard Avenue and Bergen Street. Um, it is a vacant owned city lot um, within the R6 district. Directly across Howard Avenue is a large um, institutional use run by the New York State Office of uh, Mental Health. Um, surrounding residential built form is varied uh, with buildings ranging in height from uh, two to seven stories. The MTAC train, uh, Ralph Avenue Station, is accessible uh, from this location um, by walking uh, five blocks to the north, um, just along Howard Avenue. And uh, this is a photo of the Howard Avenue development site. And the proposed Howard Avenue developments would be a four-story residential building with a total of approximately 21,000 square feet and 23 units, um, which would all be affordable um, income-restricted units. Uh, the building would rise to a height of 38 feet and would have a mix of one and two bedrooms. Uh, the building would be constructed pursuant to the quality housing regulations of the R6 district, and uh, no parking would be provided. Um, this site is within the transit zone. The building would be an L shape with an open uh, yard space um, in the rear corner, <coughs> um, accessible to building residents uh, as a patio containing um, benches and plantings. Uh, other building amenities would include a resident lounge area and laundry facility on the first floor. Uh, the East New York Avenue development site is an approximately 4,300 square foot interior lot uh, with frontage on East New York Avenue. Uh, it is also a vacant owned city, uh, vac vacant city owned lot and also uh, within the R6 um, zoning district. In the immediate vicinity of the development site, uh, residential built form is uh, four-story multifamily apartment buildings. Um, in the surrounding area overall, uh, residential built form ranges from uh, two-story single and two-family homes uh, to larger uh, apartment buildings up to seven stories in height. Um, also note directly across the street is the uh, Zion Triangle uh, mapped city park um, run by the parks department and also just visible to the right uh, is the uh, Lowe's Pitkin Theater, um, a historic building uh, used today as a charter school and ground floor retail space. Uh, so there's also uh, standalone commercial buildings that are found along Howard Avenue um, as well as Pitkin Avenue. Um, here is the beginning of Pitkin Avenue extending east, which is a major retail corridor um, in the Brownsville neighborhood. Uh, the MTA 3 train um, Sutter Rutland Avenue station is accessible uh, from this location, uh, just about five blocks to the southwest. Uh, this is a photo of the development site, um, East New York Avenue development site. And the proposed developments would be a four-story residential building with a total of approximately 10,000 square feet and 10 units, which would all be affordable um, income-restricted units. The building would rise to a height of 38 feet uh, and would contain a mix of one and two bedrooms. Uh, the building would be constructed pursuant to the quality housing regulations of the R6 district and uh, no parking would be provided. Um, this site is also within the transit zone. The building would have an approximately 36 foot rear yard, which would have a, uh, a patio space um, accessible to the residents uh, uh, containing benches and, and a planted area. Uh, other building amenities would include residents, uh, a resident lounge area and laundry facilities on the first floor. And in order to facilitate the proposed developments, uh, HPD requests an urban development action area designation project approval and disposition of city-owned property. 
and I'm available to answer any questions. I'll note that this is one of six HPD items that the commission will be looking at today. And when I pointed it out to the commissioner, Taurus Springer, um, she thanked us and noted the importance of the commission's role in HPD being able to produce and finance the amount of affordable housing that it's doing. Commissioner Efron. I think it's great to see 100% uh, affordable on city-owned property. Um, I did have a question, or I would hope when it comes back as the design plans are a little farther along, that the first one, the um, Howard Avenue in Bergen, uh, the materials, um, the developer could present at least how the materials fare over time um, in New York City conditions, um, just because they are a bright color and to have them disintegrate over time or be subject to cracks would really diminish the positive aspects of um, new units of affordable housing in this neighborhood. Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Well, the 100% uh, affordability in this case means what approximate AMI level? Um, HPD did not provide the AMI levels in the application. Um, I'll allow them to speak to that at the future public hearing. <clears throat> Commissioner Capelli. Is the, uh, is the same company gonna manage both of these units as uh, a package? Um, these are being developed, uh, I believe, by the same developer. They're sort of part of a package. Um, I'm not sure about the management going forward, but um, can discuss that with HPD as well. Other questions? Okay, the application is certified. Uh, the fourth item on our agenda, page 64, is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Brooklyn Community District 3. Um, our presenter, again, is Anthony Grande. Uh, uh, excuse me, Chair Largo, I'm recused in this matter. Okay, uh, this is a private application by Merrick Capital Corp uh, for zoning map and text amendments to facilitate the development of a new uh, six-story mixed-use building containing approximately 30 residential units, including nine permanently affordable units, and ground floor retail space at 2 Howard Avenue in the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood of Brooklyn, Community District 3. Uh, the project area is located in the northeast portion of uh, Community District 3, uh, near the border with uh, Districts 4 and 16. The project area is a uh, 200 by 100 foot area at the end of a block with frontage on uh, Monroe Street, uh, Howard Avenue, uh, as well as Madison Street. The northeast corner of the project area is directly adjacent to uh, the three-way intersection with Broadway, um, an 80-foot wide, uh, 80 wide street, and a major transit and retail corridor uh, in the neighborhood with the elevated J train uh, running above. The surrounding area is primarily residential, um, also containing institutional uses and local retail. Uh, directly across Howard Avenue uh, from the project area, just to the east, is the uh, six-story uh, Brooklyn High School for Law and Technology. Um, across Monroe Street from the project area, uh, just to the north and a little bit to the west, is a new residential development um, in the C44L district, uh, rising to seven stories. The area is well served by public transit. Um, the MTA J train, uh, Gates Avenue station is uh, one block north of the project area. And several bus routes um, serve the area as well. Um, housing types in the surrounding area are varied. Um, smaller scale, uh, two-story uh, single and two-family buildings are found on some uh, mid-block areas, while the larger apartment buildings, um, ranging in height to seven stories, uh, are found on some mid-block uh, and some corner areas, uh, cor corner sites in the surrounding area. Uh, retail uses are located primarily along Broadway, um, to the east and Ralph Avenue um, just to the west. Many of these are standalone retail buildings, um, while some are uh, retail and mixed-use buildings. 
Um, the project area contains three tax lots. Uh, the proposed development site to Howard Avenue uh, is outlined in red on this map. Um, it's an 8,000 square foot uh, corner lot with frontage on Monroe Street and Howard Avenue. Um, the lot is currently vacant. Uh, the two other properties within the project area are both uh, to the south of the development site um, on the same block frontage. Uh, they each contain uh, a four-story building. Uh, one is used by a fraternal organization um, with plans filed to convert the ground floor um, to a, a food market use, uh, which is permitted under the current zoning. And the other uh, building is on the corner, uh, the southeast corner of the project area, and that is an apartment building with um, containing eight units. The project area is within an R6B C24 uh, zoning district, which extends several blocks to the south. Um, R6B districts are medium density residential districts that allow residential uses um, to a maximum FAR of 2.0 and a maximum height of five stories. Uh, directly across the street to the north is a C44L district, which extends uh, northwest along Broadway for 15 blocks, uh, which also contains an inclusionary housing designated area, um, the voluntary uh, inclusionary program um, before MIH. Uh, other surrounding districts include um, R6, R6A, and C43 and commercial overlays are found uh, generally along Broadway and Ralph Avenue. This is a photo of the um, development site, can be seen uh, sort of in the center of the photo and to the right, uh, seen from Monroe Street. Uh, towards the left, you can also see the high school building which rises to six stories. This is a photo of the project area, um, the Howard Avenue frontage. Um, again, the development site is seen here on the right. Um, in the center of the photo, uh, we can see the four-story building um, on the non-applicant owned lot, which is uh, uh, owned by a fraternal organization. Um, and there's also a coming soon food marketplace sign. Um, on the first floor, there are plans filed at DOB for the marketplace there. Um, and that is permitted under the current zoning. In this photo, we can see the uh, uh, project area from Madison Street and Howard Avenue. So the, the other building here, uh, this is another four-story building um, on the, the non-applicant owned site. Um, and uh, this building is, uh, contains eight residential units. Um, and both of these buildings, I should say, are uh, built above the FAR that's allowed under the current zoning. So um, the building uh, in the center of the photo here is uh, a 3.8 FAR building. Um, and the other building to the right is a 2.1 FAR. Uh, the proposed development would be a new six-story, approximately 36,000 square foot uh, mixed-use building containing ground floor retail space and residential units above for a total FAR of 4.5. The proposed building would contain approximately 30 apartment units and pursuant to MIH option two, uh, nine of those units would be permanently affordable. Uh, the building would rise to a height of 65 feet and uh, no parking would be provided uh, based on the number of units and the, uh, the proposed zoning district. The building would have a commercial ground floor and residential uh, portion above rising to six stories uh, with a setback um, above the first floor in the rear corner. In order to facilitate the proposed developments, the applicants request two actions. Uh, first, a zoning map amendment. The project area is proposed to be changed from an R6B C24 district to a C44L district. Uh, with, this would effectively extend the existing district uh, from across the street to cover the project area. Uh, C44L districts are medium density commercial districts that allow commercial uses to a maximum FAR 4.0 
and residential uses to a maximum FAR of 4.6 uh, with MIH compliance. Uh, the maximum building height is 115 feet or 11 stories um, with setbacks required after the base height of 75 feet or seven stories. Second, the applicant seeks a zoning text amendment to create a new mandatory inclusionary housing area uh, coterminous with the project area, and the MIH area would include um, options one and two. And I am available for questions. Questions. Commissioner Delos. Hi, Anthony. Um, um, I'm hoping that when this comes back, we can hear uh, why the applicant believes option two is the appropriate option for this location, um, given AMI in the area. Um, it would also be helpful when this comes back if we could know uh, how many of the units that are adjacent um, that would be subject to the application are currently rent stabilized um, and what their rents are. Um, and then would extending the um, C4 uh, L overlay how will that impact the compliance of the other two buildings? Which I'm assuming mm -hmm. it bring it further into compliance. But. Yeah, so uh, it would bring uh, the adjacent buildings further into compliance. Um, the FARs of those sites are less than what's allowed under the, the uh, proposed zoning, but um, uh, the building on the corner being 3.8 FAR is uh, you know, close to that maximum, so mm -hmm. um, not creating a lot of um, development potential there. Uh, the fraternal organization site, uh, you'll notice there's also a vacant uh, space in the, the frontage there. So um, on that site, the FAR is a little bit lower, even though the, the building itself is uh, just about as, as bulky as the other building. Um, because of the vacant uh, area in between, there is some a little bit more development potential created there. That site is only 2.1 FAR. And the, the zoning would allow 4.6 with, with MIH. Um, uh, as far as rent uh, stabilized units, I would point out that the building on the corner with the residential units, um, that's a recent conversion to residential uh, within the last five years. And um, it previously had been a, a community facility use on all four floors. Okay. That's helpful. Um, thanks. Other questions? Commissioner Levin. Yes, thank you, Anthony. I could use a little bit of a primer on uh, C44 L districts, which are fairly unusual. And I think, as I was able to discover using Zola, um, <laughs> really, Thanks for the plug. really only exist along, th this would be the kind of the southern end of a run of mm. C44 Ls along Broadway. That's right. What's the magic? What are the, what's the, what, is, what are the special features of a C44 L? What, yeah. or, or the, what does the L part of it mean? So the L is kind of a reference to an elevated train. So these are sort of mapped along the elevated rail. Um, and so I guess looking at the zoning map, um, this does go along uh, Broadway, but also you'll notice on, on most of the blocks, it's also extending in um, from the corner of Broadway a bit. So. Uh, yeah, this site, uh, this district, it gives a little bit of additional flexibility um, for sites that front on the elevated train. Um, but I don't think there's as much flexibility on a site that's not fronting on the elevated train. So in that sense, it's more of a traditional C4 district with an R7A equivalent. Okay. But gives gives the the developer then greater flexibility to respond to the elevated train condition along the yeah, and I think that is restricted to sites that really are fronting on the elevated, ah. which I don't think this which one this one wouldn't qualify for. would qualify for. I, see. Um, I can try to get really specific no, no, clarification. No, no, you, on you've that. given me enough okay. enough context, but I, yeah, I can see that um, it does make sense to extend <laughs> the neighboring C four four L, even if this isn't immediately along the elevated. And you'll, you'll notice that the uh, C44L district sort of ends right there at Monroe Street. Um, and, you know, these were two different uh, rezonings that took place, one in the north portion of the neighborhood and then one in the south, um, with Mon that Monroe Street being the sort of dividing line between them. 
Thank you. Commissioner Efron. Thank you. Just because it looks like there might be some food action happening adjacent, um, uh, is an eating and drinking establishment allowed as of right under the C44L um, in yes. a commercial space? Yes, it would be. Okay. Right. Thank you. Other questions? Since Commissioner Levin mentioned Zola, I'll also note that we have another nifty new app out um, about streets. And for any street that you click on on the city map, it gives you a host of information, including the history of the streets. And our history buffs and archaeologists are quite taken with this. <laughs> okay, if no more questions, then this application is certified. The fifth item on our agenda, uh, page 83, is a certification of an acquisition for continued use of a sanitation garage in Brooklyn Community District 1. Uh, our presenter is Syed Ahmed. Good afternoon, commissioners. <clears throat> the applicant, the Department of Sanitation, and the co-applicant, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, has filed two applications seeking acquisition of two privately owned properties for continued use as a CD3 sanitation garage. The main uh, building is located uh, at uh, <clears throat> 525 Johnson Avenue and the associated parking lot is across the street at 145 Randolph Street. DSNY is seeking the acquisition of these two properties as an interim measure so they can continue to provide sanitation services to Community District 3 until the new CD3 garage is completed in Community District 3. DSNY has used the building at 525 Johnson Avenue, outlined here in red, as a sanitation facility since 1954. And the associate, associated parking lot at 145 Randolph Street, outlined in blue since 1987. In 1997, the City Council approved acquisition of these two properties for the continued use as a garage for a term of seven years. At that time, the City Council requested that DSNY periodically report to them on the progress of relocating this garage out of Community District 1 to Community District 3, which it serves. The one-story building shown here at 525 Johnson Avenue is 35,828 square feet in area. Uh, this, building, um, this building accommodates repair functions, and these are the pictures from inside of the building, the storage of the weather-sensitive sens equipment, and um, the washing of trucks. The associated parking lot shown here at 145 Randolph Street is 39,835 square feet in area. It is paved and well lighted with a security gate on Randolph Street. The parking lot has 54 parking spaces for collection, tr for collection trucks and snow removal equipment. The garage is open 24 hours a day, Monday through Saturday, and is staffed with 119 personnel. A total of 80 pieces of sanitation equipment are stored at this location. At present, the sanitation trucks use Flushing Avenue, which is a primary truck route to reach Community District 3 to provide trash collection and cleaning services. <clears throat> the garage building and the associate, associated parking lot are located within an M31 heavy manufacturing district. The surrounding area is developed with food distributors, warehouses, private recycling processing centers, and municip municipal sanitation facilities, such as Varick Street Salt Site, Brooklyn CD1, and Brooklyn CD4 sanitation garages. The project sites are in North Brooklyn IBZ. The city has developed a plan for this area, the goals of which are to retain sites for truck inten intensive industrial uses while allowing job generating businesses to grow in the area. The area is served by L train via Jefferson Street subway station and B57 bus also serves this area. 
The proposed acquisition of two sites would enable DSNY to continue to provide sanitation and cleaning services to Community District 3 until the new CD3 sanitation garage is completed in Community District 3. Um, this area map shows that DSNY has acquired a site in Community District 3 for the new CD3 garage, and that site is shown here encircled in red at the bottom left-hand corner of the map. <clears throat> the construction contracts have been awarded, and the expected completion date of the new garage is 2022. The construction of the new CD3 garage in Community District 3 will fulfill the commitment made by DSNY to the City Council and to the Community Board 1 that the CD3 garage would be moved out of its current location in Community District 1 to its new location, Community District 3, in Community District 3, which it would serve. Thank you. Any questions? Vice Chair Knuckles. Syed, there is no lease term uh, requested here. It says that the new construction uh, is slated to begin in 2019. So are we talking yes. about a five-year lease or? A, you or mean is, for the new garage? No, no, for, the, no for, the, for the renewals. For, for the renewal. Yeah. They have not given us any lease terms, but uh, I think they want to keep an op their options open. The application doesn't talk about the terms. Of if you could find out, though, before it returns. Sure. Thanks. Yes, Commissioner Cirillo. So given the history of, of this, <laughs> um, and, and obviously I'm sure the, the council is very pleased that this is moving ahead and yes. the commitments have been made. What, what has been the existing relationship leasewise? Has it been a month to month all this time? Has it? Yes. Yes, and so I guess the follow-up question is since 1997, what is the rush the controller to actually engage in this action given how soon compared to the history of this this may be complete as opposed to just continuing on in the relationship that exists now is there a reason for this today uh, DSNY told us that the controller's office wants this to go through this process and they have to certify it. Uh, that's yeah. understandable. To okay. Extend the you know, lease. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Levin. Well, on that point, their current lease status is a little confusing because it, it sounds like a month to month arrangement from the briefing sheet, but then we have the two letters from um, Department of Sanitation indicating that on one parcel, the lease, there is a lease that expires on June 30th, 2019, and on the other parcel, a lease expires on December 31, 2018. So maybe when they can come back, they can tell us whether there really is a lease here or as it has been month to month. Or a license, I think I will find out. Yeah. But <clears throat> yes, Commissioner Capelli. The sanitation envision this site for its own purpose after the new no. uh, uh, garage is built? I'm not sure, but when you know they come for public hearing, they could speak Can for the. Sure, I will ask. Other questions? I will note that I'm pleased to see the Department of Sanitation pointing to the new facility that they built um, on the intersection of Soho and Tribeca as the model for this facility because that clearly is a, viewed as a benefit to the community. With that, the application is certified. Thank you. Okay, the, the sixth item on the agenda, page 141, is a pre-hearing review of a UDAP designation and disposition of city-owned property, um, an amendment to the East New York Urban Renewal Plan and special permit in Brooklyn Community District 5. Our presenter is Alexander Patty Diaz. 
Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, HPD is asking for the actions named by Ryan uh, to facilitate the development of a new seven-story building, 100% affordable, including supportive housing at 461 Alabama Avenue. The project is in East New York, Community District 5 in Brooklyn. At 461 Alabama Avenue between Livonia Avenue and Dumont Avenue. The project area is within an existing R5, R6 district. Lots along Livonia Avenue between Hinsdale Street and Sheffield Avenue are zone R7A with a C24 commercial overlay. The predominantly land use is the surrounding area is residential. Uh, other land uses include mixed use residential and commercial buildings, open space, and institutional uses. The surrounding area includes several community facilities, open spaces, and recent city-sponsored projects. The area is well served by open spaces, success garden, um, a 40,000 square feet open space is across the project site. Le Leon's Pride Playground is four blocks southwest of the project site. This area is also well served by public transportation. The development site is a 10,000 square feet vacant city on land. The proposed development will include a mix of studios, one bedroom and two bedroom units for a total of 71 housing units. Approximately 60% of these affordable units will be supportive housing units reserved for formerly homeless households. This section shows that the building will have a base height of 52 feet with a 20 feet setback for a total height of 74 um, feet, equivalent to the buildings of the area. The proposed development will participate in the Enterprise Green Communities Program. The, um, the proposed amenities of the building would include community rooms, multipurpose room, and offices for the social services that will provide on site for the tenants. The rear yard and green roof will be used for passive recreational use. Both will be fully accessible, f featuring uh, planting and solar panels. HPD proposed an amendment of the East New York Urban Renewal Plan to change the use designation of Site 21 from open space to residential use. HPD proposes a designation of an urban development action area and approval of an urban development action area project and disposition of city-owned property. The development site will be conveyed to a developer selected by HPD, CVM Manuel, as part of the NWBE Building Opportunity Program. HPD is requesting, pursuant to zoning resolution 74903, that the City Planning Commission permits the allow community facility FAR as defined in 2411 to apply to a development, extension, or enlargement, or change of the use containing, among others, nonprofit institution with the sleeping accommodations. The approval of the zoning permit, the zoning special permit, will increase allowable. FAR up to 4.8. The proposed development will reach a total FAR of 4.02. The statement of findings provided by the applicant can be found in your briefing package. During public review, Community Board 5 held a full board meeting on September 26 of the present year and approved the application with no recommendations. Brooklyn Borough President held a hearing on October 11th on the, of the present year and approved the application with recommendations, including deeper affordability, utilizing a local nonprofit as an administrating agent, potential tenants to be located source, including people in shelters or transitional housing, to target outreach to seniors, and for CV Emanuel to continue exploration of additional resiliency and sustainability, sustainability measures with other city agencies. 
Further recommendations included that NYC DOT and MTA NYCT to advance streetscape improvements in Livonia and the construction of a free, a free transfer between the L and three stations in the surrounding area. To summarize, HPD is requesting land use actions to facilitate the development of a new seven-story building, 100% affordable, including supportive housing at 461 Alabama in East New York. Commissioner Capelli. Uh, do you have the breakout of the 62% uh, uh, that are gonna be reserved for homeless families? What size units they'll be? Um, of 71 units, 43 units uh, that will be studios are reserved for the formerly homeless. 43? 43. 43. And it'll be studios? Yes. So it won't be for homeless families? Not from the information that I have. But I can ask the applicant to explain this further during Wednesday. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Marampershot. Uh, question, you said the roof was uh, accessible to all the residents. Can you just have them provide a roof plan? Oh, okay. And also one other question with the rear yard. Uh, mm -hmm. I just noticed that the discrepancy in the plan, I guess is 30 feet, seven inches, or is it 31 feet, three inches? Just have them clarify that. Okay. So, thank you. It's such a pleasure having a commissioner who knows his way around uh, mm -hmm. building plans so expertly. Yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, um, wanted to ask about the, um, I understand the off street parking spaces will be waived, which makes sense. Um, there'll be 12 um, bicycle parking spaces. Is that, are those required or are those um, being included? Volunteer. Um, um, I will check that with the Okay. Applicant. I'm, I'm sort of yeah. curious. There's 70 units, um, 12 bike parking spaces. I imagine that demand would be greater um, than that, particularly if folks don't have cars. Um, and so if there's any way to, um, you know, address that and potentially meet uh, higher demand. Okay. I will convey to the applicant. Commissioner Levin. Um, yeah, I have a question about the current condition of the site. If you, I happened to go look at it because we were, when we were doing the Marcus Garvey um, thing and it was a nice sunny day, so I rode my bike all over the neighborhood and came across this right after we had certified it. But this is also visible if you look at the site on Street View. This is a very nicely tended site with a nice little white picket fence around it and a nice, evergreen tree right in the middle of it and some nice street trees and a mown lawn and the day I was by there people were hanging out on the lawn. It looks as if the neighborhood, somebody has been <laughs> taking very good care of this vacant land and I'm kind of curious how that happened and to my understanding, uh, CV Emanuel, uh, which owns uh, the properties around this project site, um, they are taking care of this vacant lot. Oh. So that is the reason why you see it in so pristine uh, conditions. Good, and, and perhaps also explains why we're not hearing from gardeners that it's a shame <laughs> to eliminate well cared for open space. Good to know, thank you. Yep. I would also note um, that the Success Garden, which is right across the street, is equally well loved. It includes a community garden. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, we'll see this on Wednesday at the public meeting. The seventh item on the agenda, page 220, is a pre-hearing review of a zoning text amendment and special permit in Brooklyn Community District 1. Our presenter is Carenza Wood. Good afternoon. Um, this is the 12 Franklin Street project back for pre-hearing. The applicant is proposing a text amendment to expand an existing industrial business incentive area and two CPC special permits to facilitate the development of a seven-story, approximately 134,000 square foot mixed office industrial and retail development at 12 Franklin Street in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, Community District 1. 
The proposed project area is located within the Greenpoint Williamsburg Industrial Business Zone, shown in the black outline here. It is located to the north and east of the current and future Bushwick Inlet Park and west of McCarran Park, and has access to the G train at Nassau Avenue, the L train at Bedford Avenue, and two ferry stops at India Street and North 7th Street. The area is um, located between Greenpoint and Williamsburg. The area is largely mapped with M zoning districts and consists primarily of low scale buildings with a mix of light industrial and manufacturing uses with some office, hotel, retail and restaurant uses. 25 Kent Avenue, the first ground up um, office industrial building in this area is located three blocks south of the project area. The proposed project area is the entire block bounded by Franklin Street, Meserol Avenue, Gem Street, and North 15th Street, and is located within an M12 zoning district. The proposed development site, Block 2614, Lots 1, 3, and 8, is approximately 28,000 square feet um, with frontage on Meserol Avenue, Gem Street, North 15th Street, and Franklin Street. The site is curr currently contains three buildings with approximately 28,500 gross square feet of industrial and commercial uses. The proposed development is a seven-story, approximately 134,000 square foot, 4.8 FAR building, containing nearly 112,000 square feet of office and retail space, and over 22,000 square feet of light industrial space. The building would contain retail and or an eating and drinking establishment on the ground floor, which would also contain two loading berths and the entrance to the cellar parking garage with 36 parking spaces. The second floor would contain light industrial space, and commercial uses would occupy the upper floors. To facilitate this development, um, the private applicant is proposing a zoning text amendment to designate the project area as an industrial business incentive area and two CPC special permits. The zoning text amendment would establish a new industrial business incentive area in a zoning text map. A project within this area can seek two CPC special permits, one to modify the underlying FAR and building envelope and another to modify parking and loading requirements. The applicant is seeking a special permit to modify the underlying FAR and building envelope. In order to increase the underlying 2.0 FAR, a project must provide up to 0.8 FAR of required industrial uses to unlock an additional 2 FAR for incentive uses. These uses are permitted in M12 districts with the exceptions of hotels, retail, food, beverage, and entertainment. The applicant is proposing a 4.8 FAR building and will provide 0.8 FAR of required industrial uses as well as 2 FAR of incentive uses. As a condition of the floor area special permit, a contextual envelope encouraging a loft-like building is required. The maximum base height would be 75 feet and the building could rise to a maximum height of 110 feet after a 10 to 15 foot setback. The proposed development adheres to this envelope. Per the special permit, the first floor would be used primarily for permitted uses, such as retail and or eating and drinking establishments. It would also contain a lobby, 85 spaces for bike parking, two loading berths with access to a freight elevator, and the entrance to the below grade parking. The second floor would contain point A FAR of required industrial uses, which would have access to a freight elevator, a requirement of the special permit. The third through fifth floors would feature office space with flexible floor plates to accommodate needs of future office users, as well as access to terraces. And finally, the sixth and seventh floors would be used for permitted commercial uses, either additional office space or an eating and drinking establishment with access to a landscape rooftop terrace. The applicant is also seeking a special permit um, to, which mod to allow a modification of parking and loading requirements. Current M12 parking regulations could produce um, up to nearly 390 parking spaces, depending on use, and up to three loading berths. The applicant is proposing to reduce the off-street parking to 36 parking spaces, loading berths to two, and to reduce the loading berth size from 50 feet to 40 feet, reflective of the type of truck anticipated at this site. Community Board 1 held a public hearing um, on September 17th and voted on October 9th to approve this project with conditions. Conditions include ensuring that accessory retail space for industrial uses is not counted as required industrial use space, that the industrial space created as part of this project um, would be rented at 20% below market rate, and that the applicant increase the number of parking spaces from 36 to 60. The Land Use Committee also voted that DCP allow the special permits to apply to M11 area Areas, as well as release the North Brooklyn Industry Innovation Plan. 
The Brooklyn Borough President held a public hearing on October 11th and issued a recommendation to approve the project with conditions. Recommendations include limiting the list of qualifying re required industrial uses, reducing the amount of accessory retail space for required industrial uses, requiring additional signage on the second floor, and that the applicant commit to exploring additional resilience and, resiliency and sustainability, sustainability measures and retain LBE and MWBE contractors for the project. It was further resolved that DCP should also update the IBAA text to limit, um, further limit the required industrial uses and accessory retail space, expand the um, industrial business incentive area applicability to M11 areas and smaller lots, change commercial parking regulations within the IBAA area, among other recommendations. Thank you. Questions, Commissioner Efron. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I think it's certification. Uh, some of us were asking what the status of 25 Kent is and whether or not there's been uh, anything favorable to show that this, which is supposed to be a pilot, 25 Kent was supposed to be a pilot, has been successful. That's one question. And my other question is just some clarification on the community board's request that uh, related retail would not be counted as industrial. Is that contemplated in this? I, I mean, I just don't remember that coming up and I would like some clarification on that. Sure, so in terms of 25 Kent, there are no updates at this time. Um, and then in regards to the retail, um, you know, accessory retail is allowed as an you know, accessory to the industrial use. And the idea there, um, and that's this underlying per zoning, mm -hmm. but the idea there is that if the industrial space was located at the ground floor and wanted to provide a small bit of um, you know, retail space associated with that use, that would be allowed. Um, the applicant has stated that there is this, th any retail space that would be as part of the project would not be accounted as required industrial use. Okay. Um, and as for 25 Kent, have they um, pulled building permits? Anything? What's yes. I mean, so it, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's merely finished. Yeah. And then for the buildings department with the uh, CFO and the industrial uses. Um, not yet. Commissioner Delos. But, but and 25 Kent is almost finished as for the record. <clears throat> so they're probably in the process of leasing or trying to lease. So once, it would be great to get that follow up that once that is uh, further along. Um, I guess my question though is can you um, maybe give some background into the request for increasing the parking spaces to 60? That would be helpful. And then I just want to make sure I understand the borough president's recommendation around visual representation requirements. I'm not really sure what that is. Sure. Um, so in, in, in terms of the last point, late, latter point, um, the requirement right now is that there is a sign stating that there's one of these required industrial uses in the building, um, and that's within five feet of the entrance. So the borough president would like um, the that requirement to extend to the second floor to have that signage by elevators. And then um, in terms of parking spaces, there was um, a lengthy discussion at the Land Use Committee about what the recommendation would be. And actually the Land Use Committee recommended um, that the amount provided is an appropriate amount and then the full board voted to increase to 60. The number 60 comes from um, the fact that if provided in stackers, it could be accommodated, that's the maximum amount that could be accommodated. Um, but the applicant has stated that through providing additional bike parking spaces and all the um, different types of transit in the area that um, you know, this, the 36, the what's proposed is uh, appropriate. And they can speak more to the back and forth of the discussion with the community board. Other questions, Commissioner Ortiz. Well, after the last uh, application, I appreciate the bike parking here. Um, uh, one question on the borough president's um, comments. Could you speak to uh, the condition um, of limiting accessory retail for required industrial uses? Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, an, ac an accessory retail component of industrial use is allowed per zoning if it's accessory and not, prim not the primary use. Um, and so the idea there in his recommendation is that it would pr um, provide an actual square footage limit for an accessory retail use for that in industrial use. Okay, and what's that limit? So what it's the, uh, at maximum it was 10% of whatever that industrial use would be um, or 100 square feet as well. Because we are seeing that um, yeah, much feet. more frequently right now. And so I think we do want to recognize that uh, many of these uses have this oppor opportunity for this veneer 
of retail. Right. Um, and so we want to, I think, allow allow for that. So. Just to confirm, uh, it's 100 yeah. square feet, um, or not, not, but not a maximum of 10 percent of the floor area. Commissioner Efron. I'm sorry. Oh, follow up. Yes. I mean, do do we know much about? the kinds of um, industrial uses that seem to be requiring accessory retail and whether that restriction is connected to some sort of real understanding of you know, what these, these uses need and want, because I would hate for the restriction to be too tight mm -hmm. um, if, because it's disconnected from, from a just market understanding. I just, I'd just like to know that that comes from something um, that that we can look at and see and understand. I think the concern um, presented in the recommendation is that for food manufacturing or breweries that um, the, re the retail use would be end up being a bar or restaurant. And so if there's a correspondence between um, providing something that you can sell the product, but it's not in conflict with the actual industrial use. Mm -hmm. I guess my question is why 10% and why not 20? You know, you're still getting yeah. your industrial activity and, um, you know, it might be make the use, um, the accessory retail use more uh, successful, you know, so mm -hmm. there's no reason to limit it if we are continue to see the industrial use as well. So I, I just want to understand why that limit was determined and how where it came from. We can talk with the borough president's land use um, office. Yeah, and that, that it comes, comes from, from an industry recognized best practice. Okay. Commissioner Efron. This wasn't my question, but it, nothing would preclude them from having a retailer that is somehow connected with an industrial user. It's just a question of whether that counts towards the square footage right. of the manufacturing space. So, I, I, right, I'm just That's correct. Okay. Yeah. My question was really um, n kind of a more global one about industrial areas and this innovative pilot program. And it, it was original industrial development agency, multi-tenant manufacturing projects in the 80s and 90s had a standard of um, industrial jobs per square foot. And I think that's a really healthy concept to think about. And it's really not specific to this recommendation mm -hmm. and or this proposal, but really something that I just hope we'll all internalize and think about whether that's in fact what the goal is and not the uh, use per se, because I think it would be a huge disappointment if these industrial spaces be, had a centerpiece of maybe two employees with a quasi-industrial use as opposed to a healthy environment where there were lots of jobs available in a historically manufacturing district. Commissioner Delahouz. Um, I was just going to ask uh, for the hearing on Wednesday, it'd be helpful to know um, more about the existing uh, tenants. <laughs> Um, and what their future is going to be, and um, whether or not there's plans for them to be a part of the new development. We'll make sure they can speak to that. Other questions? Commissioner Levin. I guess, on the, um, the community board's uh, recommendation that industrial space be rented at least 20% below market rate. I know that that was a topic that we discussed at some length during the 25 Kent um, applications. Can you remind us, did we do any, is there any, are there any restrictions on rents mm -mm. in 25 Kent? There are not, no. Okay, so this is maybe a reprise of a, That's right. an issue that was important to the community board at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, so we'll see this at the public hearing on Wednesday. Item eight on the agenda, uh, page 317, is a pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Brooklyn Community District 13. Uh, here to present is Aline Fader. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, this is a private application by West 16-22 Street Properties, LLC, requesting two zoning map changes and three zoning tax changes to facilitate the development of a new five and 12 story mixed use building with 78 units. The site is, Coney, is in the Coney Island section of Community District 13 in Brooklyn. The project would also include 20 units of permanently affordable housing. <coughs> Excuse me. The project area is located half a mile from Stillwell Avenue subway station 
which includes access to the D, F, N, and Q trains. The Regalman Boardwalk is south of the project area and stretches from West 37th Street in Coney Island to Brighton 15th Street in Brighton Beach. The surrounding area is characterized by a variety of uses, including residential, open space, and amusement uses. Development in the neighborhood is concentrated along Surf Avenue and Mermaid Avenue. Uh, you could see them in the map here, the northern, more, northern avenues. <coughs> The applicant is proposing the following actions to extend the special Coney Island district over the project area to rezone from R5 to R6A C24 and R7A C24 and zoning text amendments to add parcel H to the special district, establish the project area as an MIH area and add the project area to be within the transit zone. The rezoning area is in the north is the northern portion of block 7017 shown here on the land use map. You can see the Surf Avenue frontage here, the West 22nd Street frontage, and the West 23rd Street frontage. The proposed buildings would have frontages along 22nd Street and West 23rd Streets. The West 22nd Street frontage would be 100 feet wide and rise 12 stories with a basement. The West 23rd Street frontage would be 60 feet wide and rise to five stories. Combined, the development would contain approximately 15,000 square feet of commercial floor area and approximately 85,000 square feet of residential floor area to, to create approximately 78 residential units. The applicant would pursue MIH option one, which would set aside 25% of the residential floor area or approximately 20 apartments as permanently affordable. The applicant is also proposing a zoning map amendment to extend the special Coney Island district westward over the project area and a text amendment to establish the extension as parcel H. The project area would be subject to the bulk and use modifications of the special Coney Island district. They're also proposing to rezone the existing R5 district to an R6A C24 district and an R7D C24 district shown here. The applicant is requesting to designate the proposed project area as a mandatory inclusion ha inclusionary housing area with option one and option two, and they would select option one for the development site, uh, which as I said, it requires 25% affordable housing with an average AMI of 60%. Finally, the applicant is seeking uh, a text amendment to include the project area within the transit zone. The proposed actions were certified and referred out by the department on August 20th, 2018. At a general meeting in October, the board voted to disapprove the zoning change and text amendments by a vote of 23 in favor, three opposed, and no abstentions. There were no conditions. Um, the borough president held a public hearing on October 25th and subsequently recommended disapproval um, of the project, citing concerns over the um, existing housing and potential displacement. Um, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer. Questions from the commission. Commissioner Delos. So, so two questions. The ground floor is height is because of the flood zone, right? Yeah. So, it's, uh, basements and flood zones are actually usually above grade a little bit more because the base plane is calculated from the flood zone, not from the ground level. Okay. Um, and speaking to the borough president's uh, concern, which which I share, um, do we have details about? Um, the people and the housing that's at risk? Um, the, the, within the development site, the proposed development site, um, they are working on a relocation plan and I um, expect that they will be well prepared to speak about that at the public hearing. Um, regarding the um, sites that they are, do not control within the rezoning area, they would be subject to all applicable regulations for relocation of any uh, rent regulated tenants. Okay. I look forward to hearing more details about it Wednesday. Commissioner Capelli. Yeah, it looks like that you're going to have at least 71 rent regulated families uh, are displaced. And how many affordable units are going to be in this? Within project? the, well, it's hard to say within the entire rezoning area, it depends on which options are chosen and, and that. Uh, I would note, however, that while there are affordable and rent regulated apartments here, these are generally substandard apartments in terms of size, and they're also built well before any resiliency um, regulations were in place, meaning they're not potentially that uh, safe. How many are 
the units that are being proposed? For the development site, yes, uh, there affordable. would be 20, approximately 20 with the 20, with the optional so one. We we're going, we're proposing to replace 20 affordable units oh. in exchange for displacing 71, uh, no? Wait, <laughs> yeah, we could choose there. There are 38 units on this site. 15 are currently rent regulated. So there would be a net increase of five um, income restricted units permanently. Well, I'm looking at. And resilient. <laughs> I'm looking at the, and maybe I'm reading this wrong. Uh, Aline, could you call up the, the site resident? that shows the difference between the development site and the rezoning area? I think Commissioner Capelli, that might be where it stems from. So the, the yellow shown here is the, um, the proposed development site. Oh, so the other are not going to, the other 40 and below that are not going to be uh, displayed. Well, the, the 40 units, uh, um, the applicant does control that site and that was uh, the most recent development on the block and subject to BSA approval. So it's very unlikely that anything would occur with all right, that so one. Okay, uh, all right, now I get it. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Delos. Do we have um, the rent levels of the non-rent regulated units that are within the proposed development area? Um, I believe they're laid out in the borough president's letter okay. uh, recommendation. Yeah, there was I think an extensive chart that. that they've had. Done. Okay. Commissioner Levin. Um, yeah, I'll be interested in uh, pursuing this inquiry about the potentials for displacement and you know, what we're losing and what we're gaining here, I think in, in my mind, um, those concerns are paramount. But I also have a question about kind of history and the planning rationale here. Um, why is it that this block was left out of the Coney Island rezoning? I wonder if perhaps it is because this was so well, I wouldn't say well developed, but it had a substantial amount of development on it. Um, but it is a conspicuous hole in the um, Coney Island plan. Um, and then maybe this is a related question. If this is a transition site be block between um, the Coney Island, special Coney Island district to the east and the more residential area to the west and lower density, um, why is it that an R7D zoning district was selected here and wouldn't a R6A mitigate those two densities in a more graceful way? And perhaps reduce some of the displacement pressures that a rezoning might create. Um, so regarding the first question, unfortunately I wasn't here when the 2009 rezoning took place, so I'll have to. <laughs> So I'll, I'll get back to you on that. I'm not entirely we can sure. research it. <laughs> we could look into it. Um, as far as the rationale for um, the uh, districts here, um, as you can see, the uh, it was basically extending the R70 from across the street, right. um, and then providing kind of a step down uh, in the mid block area. Um, this was to kind of reflect the nature of the uh, West 22nd Street as being a major access to. Um, to the boardwalk and the beach, and uh, it was envisioned to be, uh, you know, they're going to have a park at the end there. It'll, it'll be a, you know. Okay, uh, so the idea is that um, West 22nd could take a little more, was, was more like the area to the east than it is like the area to correct. the west. Correct, yeah. Because otherwise you could just look at this map and you'd say, hmm, well, you know, R7, R6A over the whole thing, maybe, maybe, that, maybe that's a good transition too. I mean, this is the applicant's proposed rezoning boundary. I think, you know, the department feels that this is, that has a pretty strong rationale for extending the R70 in the way it did. Okay. Um, Thank you. Other questions? I'll just note that on this matter, the application uh, made it very, could, could you go back to the development site versus the rezoning area? The application made it very clear 
that in order to have a rational plan, the applicant was including the entirety of the block, not just the oddly shaped mid-block portion. Um, it was reported at the um, a discussion at the community board that the applicant's representative um, chose to say city planning made me do this. And um, the same applicant's representative was involved with the South Portland Street where we encountered the same situation. Um, and I certainly intend to ask about that because again, we are focused, unlike the BSA, on a well-considered plan rather than um, middle of block up zonings. Thank you. This will go to the public hearing on Wednesday. Item nine on the agenda, page 356, is a pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendments and special permit in Brooklyn Community District 2. Our presenter is Anan Amin. Afternoon, commissioners. 570 Fulton is set for pre-hearing on Wednesday or sorry, set for a public hearing on Wednesday. This is a pre-hearing. <laughs> this is an application by 570 Fulton LLC seeking a map amendment, zoning tax amendments, and a special permit. Together, these applications would facilitate the development of a new approximately 200,000 square foot mixed use building with office space, residential apartments, and retail at 570 Fulton, located in downtown Brooklyn, Community District 2. The proposed project area is within the special downtown Brooklyn district outlined here in green. The proposed rezoning area seen in red is located at the intersection of Fulton Street and Flatbush Avenue. The project is located in the core of the city's third largest central business district and is surrounded by major institutions such as Long Island City University and Brooklyn Hospital to the north and flanked by the Brooklyn Cultural District to the south and east. To the west of the vibrant Fulton Mall retail corridor and major developments such as City Point and Metrotech. And in general, the area is well served by transit with the 2, 3, 4, 5, BQ and R lines all stopping within one block from the site and numerous bus lines running along Fulton Street. The immediate blocks around the rezoning area have a strong mix of uses. To the east are several mixed use residential towers with retail and community facility podiums. To the south is the Pioneer Building, a former self-storage facility that was converted to a commercial office building. And to the north and west are two other commercial office buildings, one that houses the Verizon offices and the other the Con Edison offices. The proposed project area is completely surrounded by high density C64 and C64.5 districts. These districts allow a high density commercial, residential, and community facility uses up to up to 10 to 12 FAR, depending on their participation in the inclusionary housing program or for the creation of public plazas, arcades, or subway station improvements. The proposed rezoning area consists of lots 26, portions of 35 and 24, and a DOT plaza built upon an unimproved street and public place. Lot 24 is currently improved with a five-story, approximately 30,000 square foot commercial building. This lot is part of a zoning lot that includes the adjacent lot 7502. And in 2006, lot 24 transferred all remaining excess residential development rights to lot 7502. Lots 26 and 35 are a single zoning lot and in total include approximately 19,000 square feet. Lot 26, an approximately 12,000 square foot lot, includes a 19-story, approximately 142,000 square foot mixed-use residential development that since certification has started leasing up, also known as One Flatbush. This building will contain 157 apartments above two floors of retail and would be built to 7.47 FAR. Lot 35, a 7,190 square foot lot, would be the site of the proposed development. The lot is currently improved with a vacant three-story, 26,000 square foot commercial building with retail, formerly retail. The proposed development site on lot 35 would utilize approximately 73,000 square feet of excess development rights generated from the proposed rezoning from lot 26. The applicants are proposing a new 40-story, 202,000 square foot mixed-use building, including a 96,000 square foot commercial base and 106,000 square foot residential tower with approximately 139 apartments. 
The proposed development would have a nearly equal proportion of commercial and residential use, with five FAR in commercial use and 5.56 FAR in residential use. In order to facilitate the proposed project, the applicants are proposing a zoning map change, zoning tax amendments, and a special permit. The applicants are proposing to rezone the existing C64 district to a C69 district. The C69 district is a high density commercial, residential, and community facility district that is intended to be mapped within the city's central business districts. The proposed C69 would permit up to 18 FAR for commercial and community facility uses and 12 FAR for residential use. Essentially a commercial upzoning, the additional FAR granted by the rezoning would facilitate much needed office space in downtown Brooklyn. Since this project started ULERP, another project, 80 Flatbush, was adopted by the City Council and established certain provisions of the C69 district within the special district. The applicants have since updated their zoning text to account for the adapted aspects and have maintained their proposed C69 district. Lastly, the applicants are creating a new bulk special permit, 10182, that would apply to regular sites in C69 districts within downtown Brooklyn and allow the CPC to modify bulk requirements, provided that certain findings are met. The applicants are proposing a waiver to the C69 tower setback regulation to allow more viable commercial floor plates. The applicants are requesting a waiver to the commercial and residential rear yard regulations to allow for the extension of the floor plates into the yard, which again accommodates the viability of the building. The applicants are requesting a waiver to the C69 lot coverage regulations to allow total lot coverage of 64%, exceeding the 40% requirement above 150 feet. Lastly, the applicants are requesting a waiver to the inner court recess ratio regulations to allow an inner court recess that has a depth greater than the width. Together, all of these waivers facilitate a mixed-use building with a base that accommodates larger floor plates that would not be possible absent the special permit, and residential floor plates that are more viable and raised above the retail corridor. At certifications, there are a couple of questions raised regarding the special permit and the affordable housing. The new special permit is based off of other special permits that exist within other special districts that allow projects to modify bulk regulations when the regulations may be too onerous to achieve certain building typologies. Examples include special permits in the Long Island City Special District and the Willits Point Special Districts. Regarding the affordable housing, the project is seeking the Affordable New York Program, also known as 421A, which requires 25 to 30% affordability, ranging from 40 to 130% AMIs for 35 years. Additionally, the project is also utilizing the R10 Voluntary Inclusionary Housing Program to increase the residential floor area from 10 to 12 FAR. The R10 program is permanent and requires 80% AMI. In total, the project would include approximately 35 to 42 affordable units pursuant to the 420A program, with six units that would count towards the six R10 IH program uh, units that would count towards the Affordable New York requirement. The proposed actions were certified and referred out by the department on August 20th. Community Board 2 held a public hearing on September 13th, and, Octo and on October 10th, the board voted to disapprove with no conditions all of the actions, 19 in favor, 13 opposed, and one abstaining. Included in their letter, the community board expounded on the factors that resulted in a split vote, which reflects the longstanding policy objectives of the community board to support commercial office and affordable housing anywhere in the district. However, the majority opinion was formed by the perception of overdevelopment combined with concerns about transit capacity and loading. The borough president held a public hearing on October 11th, and on November 30th, the borough president voted to approve the application with conditions. The borough president proposes alternative bonus mechanisms to achieve the 18 FAR for this site. These include stipulations on the affordable New York options and incentives for cultural use and subway improvements. Additionally, the recommendation asks the applicants to work with DOT to explore a loading zone along Fulton Street and to work with MTA to advance ADA plans for the Nevin Street Station. Lastly, the recommendation provides additional stipulations for the city council. So, um, together, all of these applications would facilitate a 200,000 square foot mixed use development with office, retail, and residential units in Community District 2. Questions? 
Commissioner Levin. Um, I have a question about this project about the bulk waivers, and then I have a broader question um, about the uh, um, affordable housing. So to the more immediate one, um, the particularly the yard waivers, who's affected by those yard waivers? It's hard to see from our plans. I mean, I imagine it's the folks on Ro in the Rockwell Place building um, and the building on Flatbush. Um, yeah. But it's hard to see from the drawings that we have how close, in particular, any residential windows might be to the new building and affected by the bulk waiver. Are you yeah. able to? Well, so 66 Rockwell was a, a Azure Bright development and it's on a side lot line. So they purposefully designed their windows facing at an angle that doesn't um, affect the uh, uh, legal windows for that building and the yard um, for this building, it encrouches. So will they still have 30 foot clear to yeah. so whatever? They're, they're still abiding the by the uh, window to lot line conditions. Okay. And then um, the other project that it would be impacting is one Flatbush for which they've designed That's that building their own deal, to accommodate. So, yeah. And then the last building is that uh, four story commercial building, which doesn't have uh, any residential and windows. And it's all it. commercial. Okay. Um, and then on the, my affordable housing question, it's uh, been a while since we've seen an R10 old fashioned pioneer um, inclusionary housing project. Did you say it's producing only six units? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. The so so that kind of illustrates a problem that we've long known. Um, uh, that's represented by the R10 program. Is it? We we now know it just isn't the kind of bonus that is going to meet today's market um, uh, possibilities or serve the affordable housing needs that we know we have. And um, I know we discussed this when we approved the mandatory inclusionary housing program. There was uh, some testimony we received about how it was time to take another look at the R10 program and maybe update it. And I guess my question is, it's not really for you, Anand, because it's not just a Brooklyn question, it happens everywhere. Um, is the agency working on, what, what progress have we been making on um, updating our other inclusionary housing programs to catch up with the sort of pioneer work that MIH is doing? We're working actively with HPD on this for a while. There wasn't, until 421A was updated, it was hard to think about how one would do it, but since then we've been working closely with them and at an appropriate time could provide an update to the commission. Yeah, okay, well this, the scale of this one is, you know, just gives you a chance to say, whoa, we really, this we need to get on this one. Commissioner Efron. I had a question about the borough president's request for ADA compliance in the subway station. It, it, there's nothing here that compels the developer to do ADA compliance. So um, I have a sort of general question about how the priorities of transit for these larger developments in our key downtowns, how those um, priorities of DOT are presented to developers and when that comes into the mix? Is it only at the end of the process when the borough president brings it up or is it something that you can share with us how how it happens or? Um... I think with the recent projects as we continue to see growth in this downtown and trying to facilitate more commercial office space, we've begun to have more earlier conversations with some of these sites that do present um, or they're adjacent or nearby to subway stations, but not really beholden to our subway improvement bonus. But that so far are the extents. I think certainly we can um, continue to uh, start those conversations early, especially when they're uh, large-scale projects or mixed-use typologies, which in and in itself um, are also just difficult to provide both residential and commercial space, and therefore these additional public benefits become uh, another layer to think about in these projects. Um, but I think the applicants have certainly heard the community board's concern and the borough president's concern and um, can note those and speak to them at the public hearing. 
I'm glad that you raised that question because I, I shared the concern. We as a department have realized that we need to, at the earliest phase, when a project is near a subway station, um, raise the questions as to whether there is an opportunity, not just when someone is seeking a bonus, but when someone is seeking a rezoning, a discretionary action from the commission. Um, this came to light in the context of the 241st Street project in the Bronx, and we'll give you an update on that in the post-hearing review. And it is also raised here because of the adjacency of the Nevin Street station, um, certainly a station that could use a little love. Um, the, in working in this particular instance with the MTA, the MTA believes that because of the configuration of the station, they don't see having ADA accessibility being feasible absent a major reconstruction of the, of the station. But I think that it is worth looking at the special permit that we've created, um, which has some elements of discretion in it, and seeing if there are useful conversations to be had with the MTA about improvements short of the ADA accessibility. Other comments? Yes, Commissioner Rumpershot. I have a question. Uh, is it possible to provide the floor plans of the upper floors? Yes. Uh, I think the applicants, we can tell them to share uh, the latest plans on the project. Thank you. Other questions? This will go to a public hearing on Wednesday then. Item 10, page 400, is a pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Brooklyn Community District 14. Connie Chan uh, is here to present. Good afternoon, commissioners. The applicant, Caton Park Rehabilitation and Nursing Center, is seeking a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment to facilitate an enlargement of an existing nursing home at 1312 Caton Avenue, Block 5074, Lot 4, located in Flatbush, Brooklyn, in Community District 14. The proposed development site is shown here in the, in the dashed red line. It's located at the intersection of Caton Avenue and Rugby Road, and you can see directly north of the site across Caton Avenue is the parade ground and Prospect Park to the north. Uh, the site is split between an R6A district in the western portion and an R3X district in the eastern portion. This is an aerial uh, photo of the site. Again, outlined, uh, the lot is outlined in red and has a total area of appro approximately 18,644 square feet. You can see the existing nursing home um, in the photograph. It is built to five stories and an FAR of 1.86. The nursing home is currently overbuilt as the maximum FAR permitted on the lot is 1.39 FAR. In yellow, you can see the outline of the proposed rezoning area. The proposed zoning map change would extend the existing R6A district to the east to include the proposed development. The zoning text amendment would map a mandatory inclusionary housing area with options one and two coterminous with the rezoning boundary. Here are some photos of the development from Caton Avenue. The Caton Park Nursing Home is a 119-bed nursing and rehabilitation center that has been in operation since 1968. It does not meet the 2014 guidelines used by the New York State Department of Health, which specify the minimum amount of amenity space per resident. Therefore, the applicant is seeking to enlarge the facility in order to meet those guidelines. The proposed actions would facilitate an enlargement, adding approximately 4,830 square feet of floor area to the existing fifth floor. The number of beds would remain unchanged. The proposing zoning map amendment would bring the existing nursing home into compliance and allow for this enlargement. In order to facilitate the proposed development, the applicant is seeking a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment. Uh, when this application was certified on August 20th, there was a question from the commission about whether or not a BSA variance could have been pursued to facilitate this expansion. And the applicant did meet with the BSA in 2013 to discuss the possibility of a variance, but was advised that a rezoning would be uh, more appropriate. 
And here is a, a picture of an illustrative re rendering um, of the nursing home, including a fifth floor uh, expansion. Community Board 14 held a public hearing on this application on October 3rd, and the full board voted to approve the application on October 6th. There were 26 votes in favor, one against, and five abstentions. The Brooklyn Borough President held a public hearing on this application on October 25th, and there were no speakers on this item. The Borough President's Office recommends to approve the application with the following conditions. That prior to considering the application, that the City Planning Commission and the City Council obtain commitments from the applicant regarding uh, the implementation and maintenance of a painted sidewalk extension at the intersection of Caton Avenue and Rugby Road, additional resiliency and sustainability measures such as incorporating blue, green, or white roof treatment, rain gardens, and solar panels, implementation of rain gardens along Caton Avenue and the Rugby Road frontages, uh, the installation of expanded tree pits and retention of Brooklyn-based contractors and subcontractors, sub especially those who are designated local business enterprises and minority and women-owned business enterprises. The, bur the borough president's conditions also called for the relevant city agencies for those items to evaluate the need and appropriateness of those measures. So specifically, uh, the Department of Transportation with respect to the painted sidewalk extensions, uh, the Department of Parks and Recreation with respect to the expanded tree pits, and the Department of Environmental Protection um, with regards to rain gardens. I'm happy to take questions. Questions from the commission? Okay, this will go to a public hearing on Wednesday. Item 11, uh, page 429, is a non ULERP post referral of a renewal of a previous approved special permit in Brooklyn Community District 2. Uh, here to present is Anand Amin. Afternoon again. <laughs> so, yeah, so the Wobe Square Garage Special Permit Renewal 2. Uh, New York City Economic Development Corporation and the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development are seeking the second and final renewal of a public parking garage special permit to facilitate a multi-level underground garage originally approved in 2004 and located in the heart of downtown Brooklyn, Community District 2. The proposed project, known as Willoughby Square Garage, is an approximately 50,000 square foot zoning lot owned by the city, bounded by Willoughby, Duffield, and Gold Streets, Gold Streets, just north of the Fulton Mall District. The site is adjacent to the 16-acre Metrotech campus, directly north, and the 1.3 million square foot City Point development, directly to the east. The area is well served by transit, with the Q, B, and R trains located along Flatbush Avenue Extension, and the 2, 3, 4, 5, F, A, and C lines located along Fulton and Willoughby Streets. The site and the adjacent block are located within the special downtown Brooklyn district and mapped with C64 and C64.5 districts, which are R10 equivalent, have a maximum FAR of 12, and have no maximum height limits. Surrounding land uses include high density commercial, residential, and educational institutions. In 2004, as part of the downtown Brooklyn rezoning, the proposed development site was originally granted a public garage special permit and was approved for acquisition within the Brooklyn Center Urban Renewal Plan. In addition, a public accessible open space was to be constructed at grade above the garage. The site was acquired by the city in 2009, marking the start of the 10-year special permit. The initial four-year term expired on January 27, 2013. An application to renew the special permit with minor modifications for egress and ingress for the first extension was filed by EDC and HUD on January 18, 2013, and was approved by the CPC on August 3, 2015. The delay between the renewal being filed in 2013 and the time of the approval in 2015 was due to the modification of the site plan. That renewal term expired on January 27, 2016. Because the renewal lapsed, the applicants are utilizing a mayoral override to apply for the second and final renewal and have reduced the size of the garage within the parameters of the original special permit, thus not triggering any modification actions. The original 2009 proposal for the garage consisted of 694 spaces on four below grade levels beneath the landscape publicly accessible open space in the center of downtown Brooklyn. Access to the garage would be located at the southern end of the site between Gold and Duffield Streets, or on both Gold and Duffield Streets. 
The project now will be reduced to approximately 467 spaces and would consist of a cellar and two sub-cellars with the open space remaining on the street level. The size of the garage has been reduced as the demand for public parking garages has tapered since 2004 when the initial project was approved. CB2 voted on November 14th in favor of the renewal, 25, 12, and 1. In conclusion, EDC and HVD are seeking a special permit renewal for a multi-level public parking garage. Questions from the commission? Yes, Commissioner Dweck. How is the above ground uh, space map? Is that restricted to open space? Yeah, so it's um, open space within the urban renewal plan and would remain as such. And, and who manages that? So it'll go over to the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership for uh, management after it's built out. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Levin. I have a question about the relationship of the mayoral overrides on this project and the action that we're being asked to take. And if the mayor, mayor's office can override, it looks like they can allow for a second renewal. Why are we allowing for a second renewal? But actually, what I'm really more concerned about, what are the guardrails on the um, mayor's ability to override stuff that we should be taking care of? On the more general question, we can follow up with, um, and have Anita give us a presentation. Yeah, I think we got a briefing about this a while ago. A, a while ago, and not about something as complicated as this. What I'll note here is that when there is a special permit where a renewal is allowed, so long as the applicant has filed for the renewal before the expiry, then it can go forward, even though the permit itself will have may have lapsed by the time the commission acts on the renewal. In this instance, the applicant, if I understand correctly, had, did not apply for the renewal before the expiry, and so it required the surgical mayoral override to allow the applicant to apply for the renewal, and that is what is before us. Okay, so, oh, so the override was just, <laughs> oh, yes, you can go ask city planning after all. It wasn't, you can have the second renewal. No, it's you're allowed to ask oh, us it. for the, okay. and that, hence good. this referral. Alrighty, thank you, that's better. <laughs> Yes, Commissioner De La Uz. Do we know how the garage is going to be managed once it's built? Um, who's going to manage it? Is that also going to be the downtown Brooklyn partnership, or is that going to be totally separate? No, okay. I think that's the uh, developer for which is building out the garage that's with a, uh, a deal that would happen with EDC. Okay. Okay, thanks. I'll note the felicitous nature of this. This is an open space that has long been uh, called for, and promised, right? And now with all of the buildings around it, the need for it becomes even more. The lines that made me happiest were that as downtown Brooklyn has built out, the demand for parking has decreased, exactly what you would want to see in a transit-rich neighborhood. It also has the fortuitous knock-on effect that by being required to provide less underground parking, the economics are coming into sync, um, which give us more confidence that will actually get this open space in downtown Brooklyn. So if I could ask for an assent by show of hands to send a letter to the Department of Buildings extending the special permit. Okay, approved. And um, I will note that this is Anand's last presentation. We are heartbroken to see him leave city planning, but are pleased that his formidable skills will be put to use at NYCHA. Thank you. <laughs> uh, item 12, uh, page 467, is a non-Euler post-referral of a minor change to the Harlem, East Harlem Urban Renewal Plan and a City Planning Commission certification in Manhattan Community District 11. Uh, Calvin Brown is here to present. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is an HPD application asking for two minor ac um, actions, a minor change to the Harlem, East Harlem Urban Renewal Plan and a commission certification as to whether or not a transit easement is required. The subject site is bounded by 125th Street to the south, 126th Street to the north, 2nd Avenue to the east and 3rd Avenue to the west and is situated in the C63 zoning district. 
The site is just east of the Lexington Avenue subway lines, the Metro North, and just west of the bus depot, which was approved by the commission in 2017. Um, the block is north of, the site is north of the blocks that was rezoned as part of the East Harlem neighborhood rezoning and is situated in the newly established special transit land use district that we extended along um, 125th Street as a part of the rezoning. So these are just sites, um, this is looking at the site from 3rd Avenue and along 2nd Avenue. Um, in 2008, the commission approved the rezoning of this site from an R72, a C44, and an M12 to a C63 district. The C63 district is a height factor commercial district that allows a wide array of commercial uses, but residential and community facility uses are allowed. The maximum commercial FAR in this district is six, for residential is up to 7.52, and for community facility is a maximum um, FAR of 10. Um, in addition to the 2008 rezoning, the Harlem, East Harlem urban renewal plan was amended to include urban design and open space guidelines. And these guidelines were codified in the urban renewal plan to ensure that the projects Building form, scale, bulk distribution, and ground floor uses would respond to the surrounding um, uh, context. The site will be developed into three phases, um, and once completed, um, the site will have approximately 953 units, um, of which 80% will be affordable. Um, there will be a, approximately 180,000 square feet of retail space and 5,000 square feet of community facility space, as well as 10,000 square feet of open space. Um, the project is titled the Media, Entertainment, and Cultural Center, or MEC. HPD is asking for a minor change to the Harlem East Harlem Urban Renewal Plan, which has a clause in it, um, section C3A5G, which says that no curb cuts are permitted within 50 feet of any public open space or closer than 50 feet to another curb cut. So you can see in this red triangle that there are two, um, there's a load-in um, parking space and then uh, parking for residential. And it's also um, within um, less than 50 feet of open space that is planned for the site. As part of the 2017 rezoning, the East Harlem neighborhood rezoning, we did establish a new special transit land use district along 125th Street. Um, and as part of that special district, any development that occurs within that district, there has to be a joint certification by the MTA and the Department of City Plan and the commission as to whether or not a transit ease and volume is needed um, before development occurs. Um, so that's why they have to come before the commission. Um, it was referred out to the MTA and the community board in uh, October 19. Um, we have not received a referral, I mean, any um, recommendation back from them. Um, in addition to the actions that they are requesting, a minor change to the Harlem, East Harlem Urban Renewal Plan, as well as the certification, um, HPD is also seeking a mayor override for uh, distance between buildings on the same zone a lot, um, modification to the tower regulations, and a rear yard requirement. I'll note that the types of changes um, that are being facilitated through a mayoral override are the types of things that were there a large scale that we as the commission would be doing, but since there isn't a large scale here, there's no zoning mechanism, there's no other zoning district, and that's why the, this sort of very surgical mayoral override was being used here. Yes, Vice Chair Knuckles. Calvin, I may have asked you this uh, when, um this site came before us uh, maybe several months ago. I think there was some discussion around uh, this site. But my question then, which I will repeat now, is the same developers who were designated almost a decade ago uh, proceeding with this project, or what's going on there? No, it's, so there were two things. Um, one, there was a change in the developer, and then two, EDC needed to get um, site control. There was a cleaners, and they had to go through the condemnation process in order to get um, 
control of that site, as well as to try to work with the, the tenant to find an appropriate um, replacement space, because it was a special type of cleaner, a full service right. type cleaner. Right. So they are, there will be a different developer for the site. I will couldn't check with EDC and HPD to see who has been. For the um, entire site from one to Yes, they will, from yes, they will, they will, they will be done in three phases and there's one developer for the entire um, development phase. Thank you. It's going to be exciting to see this particular block no, it's, redeveloped. It's been around. Yeah. Commissioner Efron. I, I think I misheard you. Did you say this is not included in these Tarzan rezoning? It, it is. It, no, it's no? not. It was left out. Uh, the, only, the only portion that was a part of the rezoning was when we established a special transit, transit land use district, but we did not change any of the zoning um, yeah. along 125th Street. So if that's true, there's nothing in what we are being asked to do with this Merrill override that would put it in conflict with what the principles were on the East Harlem Reserve. No. Fine. That's all. That was okay. the only question. <laughs> Actually, far from it, in that the certification with respect to the easement is one of the goals of the rezoning was to facilitate the expansion of the Second Avenue subway up to 125th Street. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Levin. Yeah, I think, so, Kellen, you said that we've not yet heard from what the MTA thinks about this. As I recall, we've done this in other circumstances, and usually it's supported by a letter from the MTA saying, no, we don't need this easement, and then we say, okay. Yeah, so the, they can respond that way, or if they choose not to respond, then it just means that the development can move forward. Um, but in the way that we handle these actions, we always um, consult with MTA even before it goes through the process. So they already told us that they don't need the site. Oh, we're pretty sure that they don't. Yes. Okay. Because yep. we really want to see the Second Avenue subway get up there. Yes. We want to be able to sure people can get off the train. No, they, they have their eyes on the ones on the sites that they need, but they don't. And this isn't them. one of them. No. Okay. And then returning to the question of the mayoral override, perhaps um, we could add this to the list for Anita to explain to us, um, again, what the guardrails are so that yeah. we know that zoning isn't getting eroded. We'll do that at uh, another review session when, when we, don't we don't have, have as 95 <laughs> applications <laughs> on the agenda. Items on the agenda. Agreed. Yes, Commissioner Marin. So I just want to go back for a second to the question of the MTA, um, because I do know that on 3rd Avenue, on the south side of 125th Street, that building when developed was required to have some sort of 2nd Avenue MTA involvement. Um, um, and I'm wondering why not this larger complex, which originally is supposed to have something? So, I, and when we consulted with them, they were looking at um, sites on the south side of 125th Street. That's correct. That's why I'm asking, because the one on the corner of 125th and I'm going to say 3rd, third, third, third. if I'm not mistaken, third. does have. Yeah, on the a, on a south side. They're, yeah, they were not looking at any of the sites on the northern okay, site. And I can say we're fully confident that the MTA has looked at this and determined that they just chose not to write a letter. But even before referring it out to them formally, we knew from our conversations with them that they did not, they were not looking for an easement on this site. Other questions? Okay, then we will schedule this for a vote. Item 13, page 509. Oops. Uh, is a pre-hearing review of a special permit in Manhattan Community District 2. Um, here to present is Sylvia Lee. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, this is a private application for a special permit returned for um, a public hearing on Wednesday. The applicant seeks a landmark preservation landmark preservation special permit to modify use book regulations to allow retail and beauty parlor use on the second floor and to modify the bulk regulations um, to allow existing bulk non-compliance as the building's rear to remain in an existing building located at 59 Greenwich Avenue in a C26 district within the Greenwich, Ave uh, Greenwich Village Historic District in Manhattan Community District 2. Uh, shown in the photo um, is the existing currently vacant four-story building, uh, which is sandwiched between uh, a New York City Transit MTA subway ventilation facility, uh, which is the gray building to the right, and a residential building with a restaurant on the ground floor to the left. 
both CB2 and Manhattan, Community Bo uh, Manhattan Borough President recommended uh, approval of the application with essentially the same condition. Um, as you may recall, the project site 59 Greenwich Avenue is located on a triangular block where 7th Avenue, Greenwich Avenue, and Paris Street intersect one another. Within a C26 district, it is located on the edge of the Greenwich Village neighborhood. Both Greenwich Avenue and 7th Avenue are local commercial corridors. Um, the zoning lot of the project site measures approximately 1,400 square feet. As mentioned earlier, the project site fronts on Greenwich Avenue and is between uh, a vent shaft and a four-story mixed-use building. The project building's rear also faces a two-story commercial building, which is currently occupied by a restaurant. The building has an existing non-compliance with regards to the rear-facing legally required windows on the second, third, and fourth stories. The distance as shown on the uh, section uh, is between 14 to 18.5 uh, feet um, between the uh, rear-facing windows and the rear lot line under the required 20 feet. Due to structural issues, the applicant proposes to reconstruct over 75% of the entire building, including the rear exterior walls and windows as part of its restoration and uh, rehab efforts. Accordingly, a bulk waiver on the second, third, and fourth stories is necessary to rebuild the existing rear. Um, separately, the applicant proposes an as-of-right extension of the cellar level and the first story to the rear lot line, as shown on the section, uh, as well as a terrace on the second story, which will be occupied by a single use group six hair salon use. A use waiver is needed to allow use group six uses on the second floor. Um, the first floor is allowed commercial use as of right and will contain hair product sales accessory to the primary salon use on the second floor. The proposal has received necessary approvals by the LPC and the entire building would be gut renovated and restored. Uh, the applicant discussion of finding uh, conditions and the statement findings are included in your packages. The applicant rep will speak to it further at the hearing. Both CB2 and Manhattan Borough President recommended approval of the application with the same condition that eating and drinking use be prohibited. In sum, to facilitate the proposed development, the applicant is seeking the grant of a special permit pursuant to Section 74711 of the Zoning Resolution to modify the use regulations as well as the bulk regulations. I'm happy to answer any questions. Vice Chair Knuckles. I just wanted to clarify, I, these, this building obviously uh, has been here a lot longer than 1961, so is that why the rear yard is 20 feet rather than 30 feet? I believe so. Okay. Yeah, the building was constructed, I Before believe, 1961. Um, in the 1800s as a townhouse. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Cirillo. So what is our actual understanding of when we compare the recommendations? Because the borough president seems to be very clear that the prohibition on eating and drinking establishments lands on the second floor. But the community boards don't reference the second floor. They say the premises. So it, they look alike, but they're actually not. Or am I misreading it? I, I was trying to read the community board's recommendation, but they don't distinguish between the first and second floor. Right. I. That's a good point. I think you're correct in saying that the community board's recommendation um, and its recommended uh, restriction on eating and drinking is is for more broad. Okay. However, be, due to the scope of the 74711 special permit application, I think um, if the commission were to consider the the, uh, the recommendation in the context of the scope of the special permit, then um, it would only be on, on the, the second, second floor. floor. Okay. I just just wanted to be clear on that because they look the same, but they really aren't in, in, in the words. Um, but also they're recommending a restricted declaration or is that something we're a road we're going down? No. no. Okay, thank you. Decades ago. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Efron. Only because we have a photo. It says canine styles, which I believe is a dog grooming. It, that is not the intended use afterwards or does hairdressing cover dog grooming too? And the reason I ask <laughs> is why do they need a terrace? Right, the so dog grooming was the business that previously okay. um, occupied the ground floor. Okay. Um, the building um, 
the, the intention of the applicant is to use the ground floor and second floor and the terrace to be a single hair salon uh, establishment. So the second floor will be salon services. Um, the terrace would be kind of quiet, um, you know, waiting <laughs> area for the, you know, patrons were to, you know. Um, okay. No dogs. Yeah. No, not that I'm aware of. Although doggy daycare certainly is a booming industry. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, we'll hear this at the public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you. Item 14, page 550, is a pre-hearing review of a UDAP designation and disposition of city-owned property in Manhattan Community District 3. Uh, Matthew Pietras is here to present. The Commissioner De La Uz is recused. Yes. yes, okay, sorry, sorry. that's okay. Good afternoon, commissioners. Phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an HPD application that's coming back for public hearing on Wednesday. Uh, it's an application for UDEP designation, project approval and disposition of city-owned land for two non-contiguous lots in East Village. These actions would facilitate the development of 10 co-op units with ground floor commercial space and 11, 11 affordable rental units. As you may recall, the project area is in the East Village, um, Community District 3, on the block bound by Avenue A, East 13th Street, Avenue B, and East 12th Street. Site 1 is located at 204 Avenue A, and that is within an R7A zoning district with a C25 overlay. And Site 2 is located at 535 East 12th Street, and that's within an R8B district. The surrounding area is primarily residential with brownstone style row houses and multifamily buildings, generally ranging in height between four and eight stories. Uh, Stuyvesant Town and P Peter Cooper Village is to the north. Tompkins Square Park is to the south. Um, and other open spaces include Sawyer Park, which is directly across from Site 2, and El Sobriante Junior Garden, which is directly adjacent to Site 2. Development Site 1, located at 204 Avenue A, is a currently vacant building, vacant since 2008. It originally contained six residential units, two commercial units, and was four stories, or currently is four stories. The proposed development will rise 68 feet in height and be seven stories, and it will contain the 10 cooperative units that are intended to be sold to the former relocated tenants. And the ground floor commercial space uh, is yet to be determined. Development site two is also vacant. It's five stories in the height, um, and it contained eight residential units. The proposed development is six stories, rising 60 feet in height, and this will contain the 11 one-bedroom rental units. Both the community board and the borough president recommended approval without conditions. I'd be happy to take any questions. I'm just surprised that there are till buildings in this area. I mean, I would yeah. have, uh... <laughs> after all it's said and done. Questions? There being none, this is on for public hearing. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, item 15, page 580, is a pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendments and disposition of city-owned property in the Bronx Community District 6. Takiya Jordan is here to present. Good afternoon. This is an application by the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation and Development, seeking approval of disposition of a publicly owned site at 656 East 176th Street. I'm sure. <laughs> In addition, HPD and the co-applicant Proxy Estate are seeking a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment for the proposed project area that includes uh, both the publicly held lots being disposed of, as well as an adjacent privately held site. The actions pursued would facilitate the construction of a new 11-story, 100% affordable housing development. The project is located in Community District 6, which is in the Tremont, and in the Tremont Belmont, Belmont section of the borough. The development site is located in a predominantly residential neighborhood, East Tremont Avenue, which is a major commercial corridor, is to the north of the project area. 
and is characterized by one and two story commercial buildings. The three lots that make up the development site are currently under develop, undeveloped and fenced and used for parking. The publicly held lot is used for public parking while the city owned properties are used as accessory parking for the nearby Department of Health and Mental Hygiene office employees. Uh, these 18 parking spaces will be relocated during construction to uh, an existing parking lot north of Tremont Avenue and will be replaced on site as a part of the new development. There are several parks, schools, and government offices in the area, including the Community Board 6 offices and the aforementioned Department of Health Center, um, which are both on the block just north of the site. Immediately south of the project area is the Cross Bronx Expressway. The area is served by transit with immediate access to several bus lines and within a mile of both Metro North and subway service. Much of the area surrounding the development site is zone R71. In 2010, East Tremont Avenue in this area was rezoned to a C44A and C45X as part of the Third Avenue, Tremont Avenue rezoning undertaken by the department. Depicted here are the three lots that make up the project area or the development site, which are the same for purposes of this application. HPD is seeking approval of disposition of the two city-owned lots shown here in red, which are block 2945, lots 65 and 66. Shown in blue is the adjacent privately owned lot that will be a part of the project site. The development site is currently zoned in 1-4. In 1981 and 1982, the Department of Sanitation pursued site selection, acquisition, and rezoning of the project or, um, area in order to facilitate construction of a new sanitation garage. As the garage was never constructed, HPD is currently seeking to return zoning in this area to residential zoning. Here are photos of the project site. In the upper left hand, you can see uh, the site as is currently used for parking. And in the other two images are neighboring residential buildings. The proposed actions would facilitate the construction of 157 units of affordable housing in a approximately 128,000 square foot, 11 story residential building. The building will step down from 11 stories to eight and five along Cretona Avenue. It will be 100% affordable with apartments in the building being rented to individuals and families with incomes between about 27 and 80% AMI, with 10% of the units set aside for a formerly homeless. No residential parking is required on the site, and while the 18 parking spaces I discussed will be provided on site for the Department of Health, no residential parking is being proposed. This is um, a breakdown of the uh, current unit mix and um, income targets. Of course, as HPD says, is subject to change. I guess we'll know on Wednesday. And the project has been before both the community board as well as the Bronx Borough President and both approved um, in the community board. There was some discussion of the concern around no parking being provided for new residents at the site. Uh, the borough president recommended with no, no comment other than he thought it was a, he thought that this was a great proposal. Questions from the commission? Okay, we'll hear it on Wednesday at the public hearing. Item 16, uh, page 605, is a pre-hearing review of a city map amendment in Queens Community District 13. Uh, Philip Montgomery is our presenter. Good afternoon, again. It's a returning for pre-hearing review is an application by the New York City Department of Transportation seeking an amendment to the city map. 
the proposed amendment will facilitate both the construction of the New York City Police Department's new 116th Precinct Station House and potential future development by DOT. Uh, this is in the Rosedale neighborhood of Queens Community District 13. <clears throat> In addition to this proposed city map amendment, there were two previous land use application approvals uh, required to facilitate the project. Uh, those actions included a site selection action and a zoning map amendment. Uh, the city planning commission approved the applications in March of this year, and they were subsequently approved by the city council in May. <clears throat> Uh, a portion of the new station house is proposed to be constructed within the mapped but unbuilt bed of North Conduit Avenue. And at the time of the previous approvals, the applicant, the NYPD, was going to seek a waiver of GCL 35 from the BSA. Uh, it was later decided that DOT would pursue this city map amendment. The subject portion of North Condu Conduit Avenue is city owned, mapped to an irregular width, and is not open to traffic. It is currently occupied by parking and landscaping. On October 22nd, Community Board 13 approved the application without conditions by a, photo, by a vote of 36 in favor, zero opposed, and zero abstentions. And on November the 16th, the Borough President's Office also approved the application without conditions. Would that they were all this straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments or questions from the commission? Okay, this will go to public hearing on Wednesday. The NB. Item, item 17, uh, page 615, is a pre-hearing review of the zoning map and zoning text amendment in Queens Community District 11. Uh, Scott Solomon is here to tell us uh, what happened. Uh, Chair Largo, I'm recused from this matter. Good afternoon. Again, this is a pre-hearing item. Uh, Co-applicants 24115 Northern LLC and North Shore Realty Group propose a zoning a map amendment and a zoning text amendment for the entirety of portions of six lots in the Douglas neighborhood of Queens Community District 11 in order to facilitate two separate development projects. One, a, an eight-story residential building referred as Development Site 1 and a five-story mixed-use building which includes a ground floor restaurant refer, referred as Development Site 2. In addition, a zoning text amendment is proposed to designate the area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area. Uh, project area is located less than one mile west of the Nassau County border, uh, a quarter mile south of Douglaston Railroad Station, a half mile east of the Cross Island Parkway, and one mile north of the LIE. The surrounding area is characterized by single family detached homes to the northeast and south of the project area within the black dotted lines on the area map above, and non-compliant, non-conforming six and seven story multifamily apartment buildings, both within and outside of the project area. Additionally, there are several buildings containing various retail and office uses in the surrounding area. The project area is located on the northwest, northwest corner of the intersection of two major thoroughfares, the two-lane Douglaston Parkway running north-south and Northern Boulevard, a multi-lane street that serves as a commercial corridor for the neighborhood located to the south of the project area. Alley Pond, uh, Alley Pond Park is located just west and north of the project area, and Udall, Udall's Cove Park is located one block east. The zoning there is primarily low density R12, R2A, and R31 residential districts with commercial overlays located along Northern Boulevard and along the railroad station to the north. In addition to the nearby rail station, the area is served by uh, New York City Transit Bus Service, the local Q12 and the Express QM3. Uh, they both have uh, stops at, uh, at the project area. Bus service to Nassau County is provided by the Nassau Intercounty Express and 20 and 21 lines along Northern Boulevard. The project area consists of approximately 113,000 square feet across all or portions of six tax lots adjacent to Alley Pond Park, including the two development sites. Development site one is currently vacant, and development site two contains a one-story structure that was previously used as an automotive service station and is now used as an accessory parking lot for a restaurant located across the street owned by the co one of the co-applicants. There are uh, three of the lots are developed with six and seven story non-complying and non-conforming apartment buildings. And the remaining lot is an accessory parking lot, rear parking lot for the narrow northernmost building in the project area. Uh, as a reminder, here are uh, photos of the existing conditions, uh, working from the south of Northern Boulevard, 
looking, going up north, looking across Douglas and Parkway into the development site one. and to the north of the project area. Uh, applicants are seeking a zoning map amendment to uh, zone, rezone a R12 to R6A uh, for the entirety of the project area, uh, or portions of the entirety of the project area, and also establish a C12 commercial overlay for the corner lot, development site two. In addition to the applicant proposes mapping MIH. Uh, the zoning map change above with the proposed zoning on the right uh, Deliberately maintains a portion of the existing R12 to remain as a low density buffer between the project area and Alley Pond Park. The approximately 27,000 square foot buffer results from the R6A having a consistent defined depth of uh, 170 feet. Within the buffer, additional parking will not be allowed. Where the entirety of the lot zone R6A, parking would be a permitted obstruction. The proposed R6A district has a maximum basic FAR of 3.0, 3.6 for inclusionary housing, and 3.9 for affordable independent residences for seniors or heirs. The proposed C12 overlay permits local commercial uses up to an FAR of 2.0. Uh, the C12 is the same overlay located on the eastern side of Douglas and Parkway and clustered around the railroad station to the north. The uh, Designated MIH area would be coterminous with the project area, and both options one and two would be mapped. The applicants recommend option uh, two to be the most appropriate for the project area, which would restrict 30% of the floor area as permanently affordable to households at an average of 80% AMI. The applicant will satisfy the MIH requirement by providing affordable independent residences for seniors or heirs on both sites, restricting units to individuals and families 62 of age or older. Heirs further restricts excuse me, <clears throat> restricts households to be, to be at or below 80% AMI, not an average AMI. Within the Douglaston Little Neck Neighborhood Tabulation Area, or NTA, those aged 65 and older make up 20% of the population compared to 13% for the entire city. For the three nearest census tracts, the number increases to 22%. The median household income for the neighborhood tabulation area is $83,000. Uh, in the rendering above the development site one, the following set of drawings are for illustrative purposes only. Development site one, the, the co-applicant proposes an eight-story, 51,000 square foot multifamily residential building containing 24 units, 14 of which will be for heirs. 19 parking spaces will be provided, however, only six are required. The development site above, fronting Douglaston Parkway, is the first the 60-foot, six-story base. Maximum 65 feet is allowed. Then a 10-foot setback required on a wide street leading to a maximum allowed building height of 80 feet. The rear portion of the building is only five stories, then leading uh, by the roof of the subcellar. Uh, an eight-foot side yard is located in the southwardly side. Access to the below-grade parking and permitted obstruction is located here. As proposed, none of the adjacent building lot line windows would be built upon. Uh, the elevations, uh, front on the left, rear on the right, due to the downward slope of the site, the cellar and subcellar where, where parking will be located can be seen in the rear, rear elevation. On development site two, the co-applicant proposes a five-story, 81,000 square foot mixed-use building containing 59 units, 20 of which will be for heirs, and a 12,700 square foot ground floor eating and drinking establishment. 89 accessory parking spaces will be provided, however, only 64 are required. The co-applicant currently operates a restaurant across the street in a leased space with no on-site parking. This development will allow them to be their own landlords and provide on-site parking. In the site plan above development site two, uh, you can see that the bulk of the building is located closest to the street frontage. The uh, portion adjacent to the six-story building uh, that would touch upon any of the lot line windows is the one-story. Uh, portion. Um, the proposed building will have a maximum base height of 64 feet, 5 inches, and a total building height of 75 feet, 6 inches. The elevation uh, above uh, the Northern Boulevard frontage, uh, vehicle access to the cellar and subcellar garage located to the left, and the primary entrances to the restaurant throughout. Uh, the elevations fronting Douglaston Parkway, you can see the adjacent seven-story apartment building and dedicated uh, residential entrance of the proposed building. After being certified in August, the community board uh, 
recommended disapproval by a vote of zero in favor, 24 in opposed, two abstaining on October 22nd. Uh, the public hearing was attended by well over 200 residents, uh, 13 spoke in opposition, one spoke in favor. The relatively high turnout uh, was part and due to a large contingent, contingent opposition, but also just a general interest in the community who didn't know what the project was and, and showed up to find out. Um, the public hearing began immediately with public comment, which was unusual in that the, pub, the, uh, the applicant wasn't able to initially present the proposal, and all the opposition or comments in opposition sort of painted a picture prior to the applicant being able to. Um, the applicant felt uncomfortable, and they left prior to the vote taking place, approximately an hour into the meeting. Um, primary concerns that were discussed and incorporated into the community board's recommendation letter uh, although there were no conditions, were concerns that the proposal is a spot zoning that would create a precedent for the CPC to extend the existing or the proposed R6A westwardly over uh, Northern Boulevard that touches upon Alley Pond Park. Uh, CB, the community board feels like the character of the low density neighborhood would be in danger. The community board uh, would prefer that the applicants seek uh, relief from the board and standards and appeal, as had been done uh, previously for the corner lot, but not to the degree uh, that would facilitate the applicant's proposal. They were upset that the applicant team did not present separately to a transportation committee to discuss congestion and high parking demand. Uh, however, they did address it during the previous meeting, but they wanted to go into more detail, but the applicant was not able to attend that meeting. Uh, there was general concern about additional congestion, high parking demand related from the additional commercial residential chip generation. Uh, several residents expressed concerns about double parking uh, that's on a regular basis from patrons that use re retail use. There was already growing concern in the community about a recently installed bike lane that was separate from this proposal. Uh, residents expressed concerns about pedestrian safety at their intersection, especially for the elderly with mo or those with mobility issues. And then there was a, just a general concern about the impact of an existing infrastructure, sewers and schools. However, the ne negative declaration was issued prior and addressed all these issues. Um, I expect the applicant to address them further at the public hearing. Uh, Queensborough president uh, held a hearing November 15, 15th, 14 speakers in opposition, 12 in support. Uh, she issued two, uh, two recommendations, a disapproval for, with conditions for the zoning map amendment, but a approval with conditions for the zoning text amendment. They were the identical conditions, but a no on the map, yes on the MIH. Uh, her conditions were to decrease the height of the proposed eight-story building to seven stories, to restri uh, uh, record a deed restriction to enforce it, a commitment to market all apartments to persons age 55 and over, and to coordinate with the city DOT to mitigate to study safety issues at the intersection and provide mitigation solutions. Um, I also expect the applicant to fully address all these issues. The conclusion, in conclusion, approval of this application would facilitate development of 83 units, 34 is permanently affordable to uh, affordable for seniors and 12,000 square foot restaurant. In addition, the, app, the other apartment buildings will be brought into conformance or greater compliance. Thank you. Questions from the commission? Commissioner Efron. I just want to double check. If they recommended disapproval, 24 voted in favor of disapproval, right? Uh, I, technically, they voted for a resolution in dis, a disapproval. Yeah, actually, can I just jump in? It's we, sort of we, a we, so what happens is the, the, the community boards pass a resolution to disapprove generally. That's what they do. And they vote in favor of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I will say that at the department, we find that confusing to say that it was disapproved with a vote in favor and then opposed and then abstaining. And so what we've chosen to do is say zero voted in favor of the application, 24 opposed the application, and two abstained from voting. Is that clear, clarify? It's it's clear, it's just okay. consistent with what right. it's with what's come before us. So thank you for okay. clarifying. I, I, I think we tried to make that clear across. All, we had a number of conflicted votes, and I, they should all have been the same. Okay. And, and their, their, today. their letters of concern was consistent with how this vote is represented. Yeah. They just wrote that they were approving. But the letter is clearly It's against. really marginal compared okay. to the main sure. issue here, and I look forward to the hearing. 
but we did realize that we were confronting this odd, and so we are going to normalize going forward. <laughs> Other questions? Commissioner Levin. Um, so Scott, on the, um, in the rezone, in the, in the project area, mm -hmm. there are a number of existing buildings. Yes. Are they built to an R6A scale? Will this rezoning match those existing buildings? They're, they're closer to the R6A. I, I believe one of them will be a, slightly above the FAR, but all of them will be at or below. The height limits also are more consistent with R6A. Uh, an R5, which would be the next one below, would, wouldn't provide that compliance. Okay. Um, and the R6B would be too little as well okay. and fall on. So we're really catching up. So the application really seeks to catch up with the uh, existing built environment and then yes. facilitate these two infill projects. Exactly. Okay. And given the um, uh, situation you described with the community board presentation, I hope the applicant will understand that they will have an orderly chance to present their application to us. And I hope that the applicant will choose to come with principals and not just send representatives. They'll, they'll be well represented. Okay. It's always helpful to speak directly to the people who are going to carry out these projects and not just their hired help. Sure. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, then this will be our last public hearing on Wednesday. Um, moving on to future votes uh, for Wednesday, December 5th. Staff have prepared reports for the following. Uh, the Two Bridges large-scale residential development, uh, which I believe you received materials in your package on Friday for addressing questions. And, and there was a, yes, and there was a letter just distributed just now. I apologize for the right now, but um, this was received very late in the day on Friday, <laughs> the incoming letter to which we responded. Okay. Okay, uh, moving on, also the uh, Waterside Plaza Urban Renewal Area Extension. Oh, nothing to discuss. Okay. Uh, 4697 3rd Avenue. 100-03 North Conduit Avenue rezoning. The Olmstead Beale House Park. Um, also scheduled for decisions are 390, 394 Yetman Avenue and 860 Edge Grove Avenue in Staten Island. Both actions are pursuant to the South Richmond uh, District. Uh, moving on to post-hearing follow-ups, uh, we have 51 White Street. Okay. Um, and then East 241st Street rezoning, I believe the Bronx office had some yeah. discussion. Yes. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, at the November 14th hearing for the 241st Street project, uh, it was brought to our attention the opportunity for an elevator uh, as part of an easement uh, with the development. I just, we just want to say that since that time, uh, there have been significant positive discussions uh, with both HPD uh, and MTA and the applicant team uh, in moving that forward. And so this will be an HPD uh, subsidized project. And so we expect that uh, that will uh, be an opportunity there that will happen. The, the vote will be on the 19th, so we are a little bit behind in terms of the, the commission, but it will, uh, the council member is also aware of this as well. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. And special thanks to you, Vice Chair, for having raised this issue. Uh, also for post-hearing follow-up, 895 Bedford Avenue rezoning. Uh, and the DOT, Staten Island Maintenance and Repair Facility, I believe there was a letter in your package addressing some of the issues raised there. Okay. And with that, the review session is over. Yeah.